Okay. Years ago said, First of all, if you'd stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. So we have that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. No, Roll call, please. So what it do? Eva Henry, Here. Jeff Baker, Bill Holen, Here. Elise Jones, Here. David Beacom, Greg Stokes, Randy Wheelock, Sean Wood, Chrissy Fanganello, Here. Robin Kniech, Kevin Flynn, Roger Partridge, Here. Gail Watson, Libby Zabo, Here. Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Bob Roth, Here. Larry Vidham, Here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Ann Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Here. Tara Radloff, Jeff Blue, Here. George Teal, yes, Doris Chular, Carrie Penaloza, Laura Crispin, Here. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Kara Swanson, Joe Jefferson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Here. Daniel Dick. Here. Lisa Jones. Laura Brown. Lynette Kelsey. Henry Ergot. Scott Norquist. Storm Glore. Sersha Karras Graves. Casey Brown. Ron Rakowski. TJ Gordon. Mike Hillman. Brad Weasley. Here. Shakti. Here. Jerry Bean. Isaac Levy. Phil Sunanik. Present. Wynn Shaw. Here. John Peck. Here. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Connie Sullivan. Here. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Sean Foray. Chris Larson. Kyle Mullica. Jordan Sowers. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Gary Howard. Rita Dozal. Here. Heidi Williams. Here. Herb Atchison. Here. Joyce J. Here. Adam Zarin. Here. Deborah Perkins Smith. Here. Bill Van Meter. And we do have a quorum. So introduction of new members and alternates. I understand that we have one and a half, I think. We have Jeff Blue, who's an alternate for Castle Pines. Uh, this is his first time here, so welcome. So am I, the, the, am I the half? You are not. <laughs> So Stephanie Walton is an alternate for Lafayette, and she's here tonight, but I heard that she has been here before. I just don't remember introducing her. So Stephanie? I didn't mean to call you a half, but. Uh, we have a, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Report of the chair. Uh, a couple of things on RTC. RTC met yesterday morning. There were three um, action items, and I, I wrote information out on it, but that was before I went through the information for tonight, and all three of them are part of our presentation tonight. So the items we talked about in RTC um, made the motion to send it forward to the board with their blessing was agenda item 10, 11, and 12. And then the informational item that we had yesterday morning was is also on tonight's agenda. It's the Way to Go Regional TDM Partnership Update, and that's agenda item 16. So all four of the items that were discussed at RTC yesterday are part of today's. Um, couple of things I don't want to steal the thunder of our legislative folks but uh, we're gonna have an update on the construction defects at least one of the items sounds like there's potentially some very good news on that and then we're going to talk about 1242 and I will point out that in the information in front of you there is a letter from the town of Castle Rock uh, expressing their opposition to 1242. So we'll discuss that during the legislative update as well. 
How about the performance and engagement committee report? Mr. Pfeiffer. Sorry, I forgot I was part of that committee there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I just chair it. That's all I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we're still going through the process. Actually, I will defer to our subcommittee, Herb, if you want to kind of give an update of the subcommittee and where we're at with the uh, executive director of search. Okay, and thanks, Bob. Uh, the invitations for our proposals are out. They've been out for a week and two days. The closing period is April 27th. If they, any search firms wish to submit a proposal, the subcommittee will be meeting on April the 28th to review how many we received, and those will be start the evaluation on the 28th. We hope to have a initial report back to the P&E committee on the 3rd. Where did Roxy go? It is the 3rd. 3rd of May. I yep. remember that. That's all I have, sir. Anything else, Bob? Nope, that's it. That's all we're focused on. Thank you very much. Uh, finance and budget. All right. Just uh, the diet. Thank you. Uh, a couple things. We, uh, we, we gave the executive director the ability to execute some AAA contracts and a grant, uh, which there's a press release in front of you as well. You can read that in more detail. Uh, we also uh, talked about it last month, but um, the uh, executive director, uh, Rex, uh, gave us uh, some information on a building lease uh, possibility of expanding uh, or extending our building lease uh, 10 additional years. We're uh, four years away from it lapsing. But there's an opportunity uh, with another, um, another company moving out where we could gain some space because AAA is growing so much um, and also uh, extend at potentially sub-market uh, uh, sub rates. Uh, but, but again, we're, we're kind of uh, leaning on uh, uh, Director Rex and um, and our Sam, our, our real estate person. So uh, we've talked about that. Uh, we don't have anything firm, but we do have the potential to have a special meeting on May 3rd if something happens. And uh, it, it is within the uh, proviso of the Finance and Budget Committee to uh, to render a decision on that and not come to the board. So if there's any uh, questions, concerns, or, or information, um, everybody's very welcome to the May 3rd uh, meeting or to uh, to ask us questions uh, here right now. Any questions for the committee chair? Mr. Sunanik. Not on that topic. <laughs> John, uh, my understanding is the Finance Committee reviewed the ACA grants and approved them uh, so that you might want to share that with the board. Well, um, Chair, I think I think you're probably more more well read in with with detail. I will yield to you so you can give. Uh, uh, it, the best uh, there's a, a process that the ACA, uh, which is the Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, as this board uh, takes a look at transportation, they look at senior program uh, grants that come primarily from both the state and the federal Older Americans Act uh, that are out there, uh, and some of. Uh, them have to be done by certain categories of like transportation or home care or the ombudsman uh, program uh, is also funded uh, through the ACA and so uh, those were presented to the Finance Committee and I heard there were no questions although no, no, no. You, di you didn't invite me to be there no. <laughs> you're always welcome Phil intentionally did not <laughs> So when John said something about execution of contract, it reminded me of a story, and if you'll allow me for just one moment. So in the late 1970s, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were a horrible football team, and they had a coach by the name of John McKay. And after a particularly bad loss, a reporter asked him, what do you think about the execution of your offense? And he said, I'm in favor of it. <laughs> Report of the executive director. Oh, man, it's hard to follow that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a number of items to th this evening. Uh, the first is the Dr. Cog Award celebration. The flyer is at your seat. It's the one that's kind of an off-color white here. Um, 
Uh, the event is next Wednesday, April 26th. Cocktails reception starts at 6 p.m., and the program would begin shortly after that at 7. Um, it's your last chance to register. It closes at noon on Thursday. Um, Amelia Earhart will once again be the MC for the event, and um, all board directors and, and alternates are invited to attend the event for free. So uh, we really would like to have as many directors and alternates as possible. After all, as I said last month, this is your event, and we strongly encourage you to come and celebrate the people, communities, and the projects that make this region so great. So instructions to register are on the back side of this, um, of this form. And um, staff also wanted me to uh, make sure that if you do have questions about how to register or any questions about the event, that please just reach out to us. We'd be happy to assist. Bike to Work Day, the second largest event of its kind in, in the country, um, is uh, uh, we're planning for you know uh, the, our biggest and best event ever. Um, and on your way in, you may have noticed that, there's, that we have some T-shirt stations lo located out, out front, and we really think there's a pretty sharp design this year. Um, board directors and alternates, we ask you guys to sign up for a free T-shirt for, for you guys because we want to uh, we market this. So put them on your back so we can show everybody how proud we are of this event and, and, um, and looking forward to that. And, which is June. We're Steve Erickson. 28th. June 28th. Uh, board short courses. We also have a flyer in here about the board short courses um, for those interested directors and alternates, uh, as well as community staff is also invited to these. Uh, it is kind of a, you know, it's kind of the, if, if the board orientation is 101, this is kind of the 201. It kind of gets into the greater details on specific items. I will like to point out that, um, that the, uh, the triple A short course that was originally slated for this Friday, that has been postponed. So um, I think we only had a couple people sign up for this date anyway. So we're looking at an event at a time sometime in June. So stay tuned for that. Driver, or Dr. Cog's Denver Regional Visual Resources uh, Initiative was recognized by Westward, Westward Magazine in tw uh, as uh, 2017 Best of Denver issue. Uh, they noted that our region is changing rapidly, and the driver tool developed by Dr. Cog and hosted on our website is one of the best tools available to keep up with what's happening at both the local and regional levels. So that was pretty cool. We never expected that, and it's always nice to be recognized. Um, Dr. Cog staff, uh, we, myself, Brad, and uh, and Derek went. Derek Webb went. Uh, um, went to this this award celebration on behalf of the chairman who could not attend. Um, we're honored to, uh, by the public health, as a public health hero by the uh, Tri-County Health Department. Uh, we were nominated by Tri-County staff for our efforts to incorporate public health concepts into MetroVision, including our collaboration with health community uh, throughout the plan development. We were especially pleased to receive this, reward, this award alongside uh, many great health champions and initiatives in the Tri-County tri service area, which includes Adams, Arapaho, and Douglas County, including a very familiar face, and quite un and disappointingly he's not here this evening, Mayor Bukowski and uh, Council Member Sh uh, Schluter um, were, were there to receive an award on behalf of Greenwood Village, too. So that was kind of cool. It was, a, it was a cool event. And again, it's nice to be recognized for all the work that we've, you all, and have uh, done on behalf of uh, this region uh, in developing MetroVision. Um, accountable Health Communities Grant, and John Dyack mentioned this earlier, um, Dr. Cog uh, has uh, been awarded a $4.5 million grant um, from the Centers of Medicaid and Medicare Services, or CMS. Um, it's a big deal. Uh, we were one of uh, two, two community-based um, community organizations to receive this award, 22 other, there was 24 in total. 22 of the uh, uh, awardees were uh, health care providers, so it's a big deal. Um, we're still, you know, uh, trying to get our feet on the ground with regards to this, but the funds will be used to bridge, as a bridge between health care providers and community partners to improve health outcomes and lower the cost of care. So Jayla Sanchez and her staff in AAA, particularly AJ, as well as Jenny Dock in our uh, finance and uh, our administration and finance division, we re really want to shout out to those guys. They did tremendous work on this application, and uh, we're very excited to get this award. We will be having a partner media planning event on May 1st, so stay tuned for more information on that. 
Um, and uh, Jayla will be providing uh, a presentation next month with more detail on the, on the, uh, on the grant. Mobility Choice Blueprint. Who even remembers what the Mobility Choice Blueprint is? There's a few of us still here, and we've had a lot of even turnover since then. Um, but I do have some news to share with you this evening. Um, RTD, they uh, voted in support of the Mobility Choice Blueprint at their, at their meeting uh, yesterday evening, a, a vote of 9 to 6. Um, and you will recall the, blue, the Mobility Choice Blueprint initiative was an opportunity to look at emerging tech emerging transportation technologies and innovation to help us mitigate present and future mobility needs within the region. Um, the, uh, as originally conceived, the Mobility Choice Blueprint was going to be funded equally between three public partners, CDOT, Dr. Cog, and RTD, at $500,000 $500, each. Um, the, uh, the vote that was taken yesterday by RTD, um, they um, approved an action of $400,000. So there will be discussion amongst the, the uh, Mobility Choice Blueprint partners to uh, determine if, if there, there, there's a rescoping that needs to be done on that or if uh, the equal partners in this will also, CDOT and, and uh, Dr. Cog will also have a reduction of, of $100,000 in our contribution. So stay tuned to that. We'll, we'll pro provide more information to you next month. But uh, I think that is indeed good news that uh, uh, we're finally able to get going on this. And uh, uh, Director Doug, I, I understand that Bill Van Meter had an arm lock on two of the board members, <laughs> but he loosened it a little bit, and that's how it ended up at 400000 <laughs> Those are just rumors. <laughs> uh, F&B and uh, Finance and Budget and Performance and Engagement Membership. You recall last month we had, a, we had a, uh, an item that suggested that we'd be making those appointments at this meeting. The nomination committee was unable to meet at the, uh, over the past month, so we tabled that to the May meeting. I know we made note, note of that in, the, uh, in our transmittal of the board agenda to you all, but I just wanted to make sure everybody uh, was aware of that. With that, Mr. Chairman, I am done. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments on the report of the executive director? Thank you. Agenda item seven is public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allotted, is allocated this time for public comment. Each speaker will be given three minutes. Uh, if there's additional requests from the public to address the board, additional time will be allotted at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair does request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to address the board this evening? Seeing nobody, we'll move on to strategic informational briefing, agenda item eight, and uh, Brad Calvert, presentation on ULA Colorado technical assistance. You're getting me for hopefully no more than about 45 seconds. So the memo in, the, in your packet explains this a little bit. Um, one of the things that we do at Dr. Cog frequently um, is sponsor partner organizations through any number of uh, means and methods and things that they ultimately do uh, with those sponsorship dollars. Oftentimes it's conferences. In this case, it's actually was very specific um, technical assistance that through um, sort of the, some generous sponsorship of, from Dr. Cog, we were able to um, assist um, a few uh, communities um, in our region um, complete urban uh, technical advisory panels through the Urban Land Institute, um, specifically um, the cities of Inglewood and Superior. So for a few minutes this evening, we're just going to kind of share a little bit about um, the results um, from that process. Uh, you're going to hear certainly from Marilee Utter and Brad Power. Marilee's um, long time uh, been involved with the Urban Land Institute, and Brad Power um, is with the city of Inglewood. With that, I'll probably turn it over to Marilee to kind of get you started. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for the time, and thank you so much for the support. It's great to be back. Um, I'm Marilee Utter. I'm president of City Venture Associates, where we do uh, TOD and mixed-use redevelopment consulting, but also um, a volunteer with ULI, and I chaired one of the panels. So it's my, my pleasure to explain a little bit about what we do. These panels are volunteers, they're, they're put together interdisciplinary teams of our members. We have about 1,200 members in Colorado now. And we do work primarily for uh, local government and nonprofits and uh, try to solve big problems that they have. 
the, uh, the teams are about two days long, about a half a dozen volunteers designed to address your specific problem. And we've done these at ULI. It's really a hallmark program for us around the world. We've done over 600 major panels. And here in Colorado, we've done, uh, we do about four or six a year. They take a lot of preparation to get ready and get the right people together. But we've done more than 50 of them since 2004. So we've got quite a track record, and we're, we're very, very proud of it. Um, one of the hallmarks of ULI as well is we really um, look at ourselves as a nonpartisan nonprofit. We're mostly research and best practices and uh, try to be a real facilitator to public-private partnerships. We never take positions on uh, candidates or issues. We're really there to, to service the public sector and the communities. Our mission is to build better communities. So let me jump right into these um, technical advisory panels and some of the results we've had on the next slide. Um, we've done many of them with lots of great results, and there's lots of stories uh, that I won't drag you through. The, the picture on the lower left-hand side is uh, a project we did at the Yale TOD in Denver. Um, here the team put together the tax credit pro forma that enabled the senior housing to go forward. I'm really delighted to have senior housing at transit. We think that's a, a great use. Um, at the lower right-hand corner is a little sketch that our team put together for Steamboat. Uh, when we were working on Yampa Street there, um, we recommended street improvements and a different use of the street. That resulted in a $10 million project to, to close it off and make it into a festival street, which has really been important to that community. We're proud of that. Um, another one I got to serve on a couple years ago was for the Denver Public Schools dealing with surplus properties. That netted them over $30 million by following our recommendations. So um, we've got a good track record. Um, let me move on to the two that you funded, and we're so appreciative for that. Uh, really need your support to get these done. Um, the one I chaired was the uh, Inglewood Civic Center, and this, is, uh, this was particularly fun for me because I got to be the project manager for the city 20 years ago when C Cinderella City um, had to come down, and we had to figure out what to do with it. It was really the first transit-oriented development project in the region, and it won lots of awards and was a, a great success for that community at the time. But 20 years almost has passed, and a lot changes in 20 years. The markets change, the people change, um, and so this was really um, City Center 2.0, if you will. It was a, a new look at it to say, you know, what, what can we do to make it better and to meet the needs of the city today? Um, uh, particularly around jobs. So one of the, you know, there are a lot of challenges, but the basics are the basics. You know, we said there's a good street grid there, but it isn't as well connected as it needs to be. It isn't as walkable as it needs to be. There's still a lot of uh, excitement on the Broadway corridor, but the TOD is, you know, a mile back almost. So how do we connect those better? How do we get more energy? Um, we talked to the local employers, the hospitals, they said, we need a hotel. We need a place to have meetings for all the people that come in around the country. So that was a really exciting use that we identified and recommended. Um, we also said, use the authentic South Broadway as the anchor here and, and try to pull some of those tenants and that excitement and those small merchants, because that's really the character of Inglewood, pull them down towards the transit stop. And we found that even though there's some very old strip centers in there, and you know it really looks kind of dilapidated in the middle if you've been there lately. Those, those actually, those owners are global REITs. Uh, we, because some of the members of our team knew those players. Taught, we talked to them, and they said, "Yeah, we were thinking that this stuff's happening in this market, and we'd like to do more." And so, you know, they said, "Let's let's talk to you and see about it." So, you know, it's the power of going to the the landowners. Um, so we saw lots of opportunity there, made several recommendations, and I'm really delighted Brad joined us to um, give us your take on it, Brad, and what it did mean to the city of Inglewood. Or what have you done? Well, good evening, and thank you for inviting us this evening. I'm Brad Power. I'm the Community Development Department Director for the city of Englewood. 
And I want to echo Mary Lee's thanks for Dr. Cog's support for these projects. Uh, we probably couldn't have done it and probably wouldn't have done it without the support of both ULI and Dr. Cog. Uh, Mary Lee indicated that uh, the city center area of Englewood was the first transit-oriented development in the light rail system in Denver, and it opened in, in uh, 2000. And as she also indicated, it's now time to take a look at that 2.0 version. And we thought that the timing just married up perfectly because I'm fairly new uh, at the city of Englewood. I've been there a little over a year, and I have a pretty extensive background in redevelopment and public-private partnerships. And we wanted to take a fresh look at the future of the next generation of this area. And having that local expertise here to be able to uh, identify some different alternative uses some things that we could think about was really timely. And one of the things I thought was most powerful of this session is over the course of two days, they interviewed 35 people in our community. And they interviewed people from our elected officials to our development community uh, and people who utilize the center day in and day out. And we heard a lot from those people that they probably wouldn't have told us as staff or even that they would tell from some of our elected officials. So it was a really good, honest, fresh look at the area as it stands today. Some of the things that we've done uh, since the, uh, the panel, one of the things that we're really starting to concentrate on is really working with those key property owners. There's eight to ten property owners in the area that we're having some discussions with them about what is their next generation, what are they looking over the horizon, what is their timeline for maybe taking a look at some of their property opportunities and some of the constraints as well. They're all on different timelines, so matching up everybody to do something at once is not likely. So we're looking at phasing redevelopment in this area over the, over the course of the future. And as Marilee indicated, we're really excited about some of the emerging and re-emerging energy along the South Broadway corridor and taking advantage of that. So that's a little bit about how the day, those two days came together, our role into it, in it, and some of the things that we've been doing um, since then. I'm also a, a longtime ULI member. Um, I've been fortunate to be a leader nationally um, in the organization for the last four years as a trustee, so I'm very familiar with the organization and have a lot of passion for it. And I think there are probably enough people in the room who have been ex exposed to one of those 50 taps that have been done since the mid-90s. I've had the pleasure of being on a couple of them as members uh, of, of a recommendation group uh, the last uh, maybe 10 or so years ago. If you haven't taken advantage of that opportunity, if you see something down the road, you have an intractable development problem or a land use issue, uh, I would highly recommend contacting ULI Colorado uh, and forming a tap around some of these key issues that you may face in your communities. It's time and effort very well spent. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to quickly move on to the next example, the, the other one that you funded for us last fall, which is Superior Town Center. And let me introduce Jordan Block, who is the, on that panel. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jordan Block. I'm an urban designer and a planner with RNL here. I was served on the Superior TAP panel. I wasn't the chair, but I uh, represent here on the rep, nonetheless. And I apologize for everyone in the room if you're distracted by my appearance. I had a bad run in with a softball on Monday. No. Um, so uh, I, I would like to echo a third time that uh, we're really thankful for your support for these panel opportunities. I think if you haven't attended one or been one of the interviewees, they're really sort of special for ULI. Uh, they're really sort of special for the communities that they serve, I believe, as well. And I think they can really make a difference. So thank you again. So we were brought into Superior to look at uh, uh, the opportunity to sort of uh, implement uh, trans-oriented development in the Superior marketplace, uh, which sits at sort of um, US 36 and uh, McCaslin Boulevard and is right along the, the bus rapid transit line to, to Boulder, between Boulder and Denver. Uh, the Superior marketplace is sort of a regional uh, retail center. It's, um, you know, large seas of parking that serve large anchor tenants like Costco and Target and uh, formerly Sports Authority, although that's been sitting empty, and Chuck E. Cheese is most importantly of all, I think. Um, and and, and uh, we were asked to kind of look at it from a market perspective and from a design perspective, whether uh, development could be sort of put in there uh, that's served by the transit and, and connect to the larger region. Uh, the, the conclusion we came to, and I think the conclusion, conclusion we optimistically sort of went in assuming was that, yes, of course, there is opportunity here um, for trans-oriented development. In specific, we found that there was a big gap 
um, for sort of bedroom community service uh, for, for residential serving Boulder because a lot of people, a lot of students especially and, and lower income people are, are sort of forced out of the Boulder area and that with this large transit link they're able to kind of connect to Boulder and to Denver uh, with possibly the opportunity for, for more affordable housing. We also found that there was a good opportunity for um, office space. It's, you know, great visibility along US 36. It, uh, it, it, it's sort of an underserved market in that area. Um, and then I think one of the big things we came to the conclusion of is that we want to do all of this, uh, implement transordering development and find ways to, to push that forward while still retaining these large uh, retailers. I know that for anyone who lives in Boulder, I know that uh, Costco and Target are, are, are something that people travel sort of region wide to, to shop at and we know that that's something that you can't buy. That's a, that's a use that, that, that we need, whatever happens there needs to, to be brought along with it. But we also know that a lot of these other uses have um, massive amounts of parking and, and they, that, that parking doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't necessarily required for the uses. We also know that some of those uses aren't necessarily the best uses for those, pl for those sites. So we wanted to propose some, some larger scale things that start with sort of partnering with RTD and partnering with the, the mall owner, which is a national mall owner, and finding opportunities to start sort of building off the momentum of the, the transit. And then at a more sort of fine grain level, we also looked at, uh, you know, is there opportunities to connect people on foot or on bike into the transit station without, um, without getting hit by cars on some of the larger arterials or, or, you know, coming into conflict in some way. Or, and we think there's some really easy opportunities to sort of get that first uh, stake in the ground and start making it a little more friendly for people who are, are traveling in a way other than um, by vehicle. So I think it was really successful. We, we ended uh, with some drawings showing sort of how the TOD could look like, but of course those were just conceptual. But we, we found that yes, of course, this area is a great opportunity uh, for TOD. And I think that, um, I think that the, the community was really excited about that and leadership of the community was really excited about that. Um, and I think that it, it needs to tie into some larger moves in, in the superior community, like the superior town center. Right? Um, to, to thrive and make sure it doesn't compete with some of the larger moves around the area, but we think it's a, a great site and something that really should be moved on, and I think that this TAP panel was a great opportunity for everyone to sort of realize that. So thank you again. Um, well, so we, we kept it brief so that we could answer any questions, and we certainly welcome those if you have them. Questions or comments from the board? Director Atchison. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. N not so much of a question, but just to also recognize UL ULI about two weeks ago, uh, the annual awards program for ULI took place, Correct. and they had opened up a, a new category called Inspire this year, for the first time, and all three of the finalists are represented here on the board tonight. Deborah Perkins Smith, representing CDOT, was one of the finalists for the US 36 project. Uh, the city of Westminster for our TOD station at 71st and Irving, right. and the city of Lakewood for their transit stop and uh, cultural center. And I'm very happy to say that Lakewood did an excellent job and uh, took first place in the category of a new category for the first time, and ULI did a great job. I think there were approximately about 400 people in attendance at the event at the, what do they call it, Sports Authority Mile High Stadium. <laughs> I think it still has the same name to it. But anyway, it was a great thing. Whatever it's ULI has done a lot to help all of us in the area look at projects that we have and uh, give a guidance in many cases to all of us. So thank ULI for what they've done. Well, thank you, Herb. Thank you. Director Jones. I was just curious whether, I mean, this is great, and thanks so much for coming tonight. The results of your TAPS, are they something that we could find on your website? It's, is it public information? Because yes. I think we could all learn a lot from... Oh, yes, absolutely, Elise. There, um, we, we give the client a booklet um, where we write up the recommendations because a verbal presentation, which we always do at the end, can kind of... Not everybody can be there. Let's leave it at that. But so we want to give people something in writing, and then they are absolutely on the colorado.uli.org website as well. And then we obviously would be delighted to go into great detail and debrief with anybody that would like to talk more about it. Yeah. I'd also like to mention that aside from these specific studies that cover what we talked about today, the, both on the ULI Colorado website and the ULI National website, there is a wealth of the TAP panels, and they call the Panel Advisory Service Panels nation, nationwide. And they're great case studies for any problem you might have. They're a really good place to start looking for, for some answers to problems that other communities face as well. Yeah, and, and um, we've done globally, when we do those advisory panels, they're also a ULI product 
they aren't done by local people. That's when you have a bigger issue and it's more complex and they're a five-day panel. Um, and they bring in all people from out of town so that there is no question of conflict of interest or whatever. And uh, we've done, ULI has done about 700 of those around the world, not just nationally. So we're pretty good at it. And we've done a lot in this community. Director G. Oh, hi. I wanted to thank you for your, part for your participation. We had a technical advisory panel in Wheat Ridge uh, on our TOD station. Uh, you know, really, I was hoping for a uh, sort of a uh, Disney park, but that, that wasn't your recommendation. <laughs> uh, and we were the you first to tell you that, right? Yeah, yeah, you told us that right <laughs> off. So. <laughs> so even though I was mad about that, you did uh, give us some advice as far as uh, more of an employment center, innovation kind of center, and that's pretty much a direction we're going to go. So that's great. Appreciate that a great, great amount. That's great. One, one of the things, when you're doing a two-day panel, it necessarily has to be a pretty high-level recommendation. And usually the toughest part is implementing. Mm -hmm. It isn't diagnosing, it's doing. Okay. And that's, uh, ULI Colorado is also available to help with that. So if we can be of further assistance, Thank we'd you. love to do that's that. That's good to know. Director Jefferson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a brief comment. I just wanted to thank you, Eli. Great to see their rep here uh, tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, and also my colleagues here at Dr. Cog for their contribution to this program. Uh, you know, I was able to participate in the tech technical advisory panel process. I found it to be a really well-structured process that got uh, feedback from all the uh, relative stakeholders there and ended with a really beneficial product of that written report as well as that video that lives on our YouTube channel and has really kind of engaged our community in some uh, conversations surrounding our land use uh, that I found particularly beneficial. So thank you again. Nice to see you, Joe. So we had Jones, Jay, and Jefferson. Another Jay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, if there's no other questions or comments, thank you very much for thank your presentation. You. Agenda item 9 is attachment B, and that is just the uh, consent agenda, the minutes from March 15, 2017. Are there any changes or adjustments to those minutes? They will be accepted as is. Oh, you do? Excuse me. I'm sorry. We need a motion. So can I? Move approval. Second. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Yes, abstain. One abstention. Agenda item 10 is attachment C, Mr. Cottrell. Thank you and good evening. Uh, before you is one amendment to the 1621 uh, tip, and this is uh, on the Central 70 project sponsored by CDOT Region 1. This amendment requests to add Senate Bill 228 in bonds loans funding, which CDOT is now able to identify. Though the total overall funding uh, will remain the same, the faster bridge, faster bridge Enterprise funding is being reduced to more accurately reflect that the developer and not Bridge Enterprise will secure the bonds and loan funding. This Bridge Enterprise funds that are being removed are being held outside of the TIP and will be used for future availability payments to the developer. So that is the only amendment that I have before you this evening, and I'd be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Comments or questions from the board? I would entertain a motion. Second. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Agenda item 11 is attachment D, Jacob Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. So this item uh, concerns our region's long-range uh, transportation plan, our 2040 Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, just a really short presentation just to kind of orient you around uh, what this is. Um, you know, starting with our uh, plan relationships, just kind of as a reminder for us, um, you know, our Metrovision plan, of course, that you've all been working on. Uh, for the past uh, few years and you adopted in January. The Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan helps to implement Metrovision and it's really, um, our, the, the Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan or MVRTP is really what this region, region envisions for transportation through 2040. So it's what our needs and our priorities and our vision for multimodal transportation are uh, for the next 20 plus years. 
within the MVRTP is our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. And this is our, uh, what we can actually afford uh, for our transportation system through 2040. So this is, you know, taking what's our vision, what's our needs, and then sort of uh, the subset of that, what we can actually afford based on available revenues through 2040. And then the transportation improvement program and the tip that you just heard about and you'll hear in the next item um, is actually what we're building now, uh, real dollars, real projects over the next four years. Uh, just an overview of the 2040 MVRTP. Um, as I said, it helps to implement uh, our MetroVision plan. It integrates the transportation theme of MetroVision with the 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan, tying those two things together. It shows revenues reasonably expected to be available through 2040. So federal, state, local revenues, all revenues coming to this region uh, for multimodal transportation projects, programs, services. Uh, and then it also shows funding for project type categories of which there are many in the plan. So things like system preservation, operations, uh, new multimodal project categories, just to name a few. You know, it shows, it shows uh, amounts of, of dollars uh, through 2040 uh, for those project type categories. It also individually identifies regionally significant roadway capacity and rapid transit projects. And I'll show you maps of those in a moment. So our big ticket uh, major capacity projects, it, it shows those and displays those in the plan. And it identifies project implementation staging periods uh, for those projects as well, which is a federal requirement. Um, this plan is, um, a, a lot of work has been done on this plan over the last couple of years, really the last four years. Uh, we adopted the 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan back in 2015. Um, and then this, this plan incorporates that along with MetroVision uh, and a lot of work that's been done since then. Uh, but in terms of the actual fiscally constrained plan, uh, just a couple minor amendments uh, to that uh, since, since the latest version. Uh, a lot of federal requirements and topics that this plan addresses, and I won't, uh, I won't talk about them individually. Uh, really the two most important are the two that you see in the middle. Uh, one is fiscal constraint. Again, the idea that we have to show basically what we can pay for. We have to balance costs and revenues. Uh, so, you know, calling that cost affordable or cost feasible is a major federal requirement for our long range transportation plan, uh, as well as air quality conformity, which I have a slide on uh, in, a, in a moment or two. But this, this plan uh, is subject to air quality conformity requirements. Many of the other federal requirements that you see here are either specific things that we need to either include or address in the plan, specific topics. Um, or, or priority things, or there are things that talk about how we conduct our transportation planning process, such as our public involvement efforts. One of our key planning assumptions is the significant growth in this region. This isn't news to anyone here, um, but you see the numbers here through 2040. We're adding 1.2 million people to this region and over a half a million more jobs. Uh, so this was a key planning assumption that underlied our planning process in developing the MVRTP. Uh, as well as uh, data input using the latest forecasts um, that our economic team developed, uh, including those in our regional travel model that was used in this plan. And I would say that 1.2 million people uh, feels like a third of them moved here this month. <laughs> Uh, within the plan itself, we have a, a very thorough and exhaustive look at our multimodal transportation system. You know, not just the things that we build, as important as, as those are, the major roadway projects, uh, managed lane projects, fast tracks and transit projects, but we also look at things like operations, uh, transportation demand management, which you'll get a presentation on uh, later this evening, is a big part of of our multimodal transportation system. You know, we've expanded the plan to talk a lot more about technology as that's ever evolving. Um, system preservation, state of good repair, uh, things like safety and security of the transportation system, you know, different modes like aviation, all of these topics are thoroughly sort of analyzed uh, and incorporated within uh, the MBRTP. I'll also note in particular that this version of the plan um, has uh, sort of three sort of focus areas of kind of modal, you know, components or plan elements uh, in terms of having a uh, coordinated transit plan, which is a federal requirement uh, that integrates all of the aspects of transit, you know, whether it's, it's fast tracks or rapid transit, uh, local bus service, 
um, paratransit and, and um, uh, demand response transit. Uh, so we have a whole appendix dedicated to having a coordinated transit plan. Uh, we have a freight component as well that's a really expanded uh, version from what we've had in the past and that's a stepping stone to what will eventually be. We're working with CDOT as they're developing their statewide multimodal freight plan. We're going to work with CDOT uh, to develop a Dr. Cog sort of specific uh, version of the statewide freight plan uh, and then adopt that into the plan, uh, into our MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan uh, in a few months. And then we also have a substantial section on what we call active transportation or non-motorized, meaning bicycling and walking. Uh, again, that sets the stage for active transportation plan uh, that we're uh, just about to undertake over the next 12 months uh, that will involve all of your jurisdictions across the region. So all of those things are within uh, the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, we also have a financial plan, again, that requirement for fiscal constraint. Uh, you know, the costs need to equal revenues. So this is one of many graphics in that chapter, which is Chapter 5 of the plan. This particular one sort of compares our needed and envisioned transportation system through 2040, uh, which are the red uh, bars here of, of kind of what we need by project category. Uh, versus the blue bars, which is what we can actually fund based on the revenues that will be available. So the story here is that no, we can't fund every single thing um, that, that we need or envision as a priority in this region through 2040. Um, but this plan is very strategic and being able to maximize the funding that we do have uh, for strategic, strategic projects and programs to do the best that we can for this region. Um, I said that we need to individually identify the big ticket uh, roadway and rapid transit capacity projects, so we map them, uh, which is what you see here, and we identify them in Appendix 4 of the plan. So this particular map shows our roadway, managed lane, and bus rapid transit uh, capacity projects. I uh, won't go through all the colors, it's in the plan, but basically we're distinguishing uh, the funding source and the time frame staging of these projects. Similarly, the rapid transit system through 2040, I always make a note when I present this slide because it's really about fast tracks primarily. Um, I always make the note that fast tracks is fully funded through the fast track sales tax that the voters passed in 2004 and the other funding that RTD has. But given our federal requirements of showing what can be built by 2040, we work with RTD to show those components of fast tracks um, that will, you know, that can be funded through, uh, funded and, and constructed uh, through 2040, but the Fast Tracks program continues. Uh, I mentioned regional air quality conformity before. Uh, the plan must address uh, several what we call criteria pollutants. Um, we do modeling and, and we um, have the Air Pollution Control Division, the state, do modeling for us um, to look at air quality conformity. The bottom line is that uh, we pass the pollutant emission test for regional air quality conformity and that's documented in the two companion documents, two companion documents, excuse me, that are part of this item. And I would note that air quality conformity uh, is a regional exercise. It covers the entire plan. It's not project based, but it's the network of all of the projects that comprise our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan through 2040. Uh, finally, we had a public comment uh, process here um, to, um, to get ready to adopt the plan. We had a 30-day public comment period, which culminated in a public hearing in front of all of you uh, back at your March 15th board meeting. Uh, attachment one of this item shows the comments that we received either through the 30-day public comment period um, or at the uh, public hearing itself, as well as staff responses uh, to those issues that were raised in the public comments. Um, based on the public comment period and uh, stakeholder review process, uh, we did uh, suggest a few edits to the plan, um, mostly sort of grammatical things, but there are a few uh, edits that we made to the content of the plan. We identified those and tracked changes in the linked version of the plan uh, in your packet, and then we did in attachment two, uh, just a table, just a log of what those changes were and why we made those changes. Um, I would note, by the way, the public hearing wasn't just for the 2040 MVRTP. It was also for uh, the next item on your agenda, uh, which is the 1821 Transportation Improvement Program uh, that Todd will talk about next. So it was a joint um, public hearing for both items. Um, and finally, as was mentioned, uh, Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee both recommended approval um, of the plan, and so we're seeking a motion um, that would have you adopt the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan and the associated air quality conformity determination documents. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Questions for Mr. Rieger. Director Cernanek. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, 
question came up, uh, curiosity, more than anything else, and so I apologize for not getting it to you sooner. Uh, when you talk about safety and security, one of the items that someone brought up is um, recent articles with regard to hacking of cars, uh, let alone some of the electronic or cyber issues that might be soft spots or not. Um, how much of, the, of this transportation side uh, when you're talking about safety security, deal with the uh, possibilities of cyber attack or hacking components uh, that might cause disruption? Yeah, no, that's a very important point, and um, we as staff participate in a central forum, several forums, I should say, uh, that deal with transportation security. It's not it's not something that is the MPO is Dr. Cogman, we, you know, that we directly deal with, but uh, there are organizations out there. The big one is called the North Central Region. That's kind of a collaboration of many agencies and stakeholders uh, involved in transportation security. And we work together to kind of coordinate, you know, both what those threats are and what potential responses may be. So those are definitely issues on our radar screen. There's no easy answers, but uh, we're aware of those issues and we're working together as a region to address them. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. Discussion? Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I'm actually considering a no vote on this. And I'm considering it, and I realize I'm, this might be a Pyrrhic vote on my part, but the bottom line is um, we spend a lot of time here over the last three years that I've had the opportunity to serve on this board talking about uh, the importance of multimodal transportation projects. And I, I have to confess that I come from a town that has uh, really great multimodal options. Um, with the exception of one corner of Castle Rock, guys, you can get on a bike and you can ride from one end of town to the next. We are always exploring opportunities to have some version of public transit. Really right now we're event-oriented but we're always exploring that. And yet the bottom line is when we come time for us to spend the dollars we collect from our citizens, we must always concentrate on keeping the roads paved and the roads open. Having been involved in the, um, the effort going on to look at widening I-25 between um, our southern uh, interchange at Plum Creek all the way down to Monument, um, you know, it's a, it's a $500 million <laughs> project to pour, you know, what's essentially 20 feet of concrete on either side of the highway. $500 million. So I appreciate all the work that's been done on this. I, indeed, I, I participated in many of the discussions that gave us this. But I'm starting to wake up to the realization that our devotion to multimodal with an effort to address our clean air issues that Colorado has had, the Denver area has had. Believe me, I'll tell you a story of driving home for my 16th birthday of skiing and uh, driving through Denver is a little bit like driving through a smoky room. But I appreciate, I appreciate those efforts, but we are putting too much emphasis on multimodal. We are diverting too many tax dollars from the roads that we should be maintaining and the roads that we should be building to this cult of multimodal. I fully realize, guys, this does not directly address that. This does not directly, uh, my no vote, your no vote, if you'd like to give it, will not directly address that, but it will be a part. So I'm, uh, I will be a no vote on the measure. I encourage you to join me and take a stand. We, we need to get back to the business of using the money, the tax money that we are stewards of on building roads and maintaining roads. Other discussion? Director Jones. I'm sorry, I can't resist. George, George, George. <laughs> what? Uh, come on. Like you're I'm surprised. Cold? I mean, come on. So I just want to hold up the uh, incredibly successful multimodal project we did on US 36 that include adding a managed lane on which bus rapid transit, carpools, and single occupancy vehicles can drive combined with the bikeway. And it has been wildly successful for folks who are driving cars 
as well as people who are in buses and other modes. And one of the beauties of investing in multimodal is not only did you give choice to all those people, you greatly increased mobility, you decreased traffic. We increased ridership on the bus by 60%, and perhaps most important to you, we increased travel speed by 30% across all lanes, including the general purpose lanes. Multimodal investments are an occult. They work, right? For mobility, for yes, for clean air, but um, for traffic, they're a better investment. And they aren't anti-car. They're pro other things in addition to cars. So I would encourage people to vote yes for, for um, this. We've invested years of work in it. And, um, well, enough said. Director Atchison. Well, George, we're going to agree to disagree because, uh, and I don't get to fight with the least very often, but uh, this won't be a fight either. I, I think one of the things that we're, we're all trying to look at is how do we get improvements to our transportation systems? This group, a number of weeks back, took a very strong stand on 1242, which will get discussed in a little bit. But to increase capacity and build new roadways, there are no funds in this state for that under the current systems that we have. CDOT doesn't have the money. The general fund doesn't have the money. The counties don't have the money. And the cities don't have the money. So what we are trying to do, as this organization has already taken a stand and asked me to testify at the legislature, is that we are proposing an election in 2017 to put to the voters to decide whether or not they want to increase their capacity of roadways. But this is a statewide ballot issue if we can get it out of the legislature. And I will tell you, without a multimodal component, it will not pass in this state, and especially in the metro area. Across the entire state, we have worked out a compromise with CCA, CCI, and every group you can think of has come together with one initiative get something on the ballot that gets us money coming in on a recurring basis for 20 years to get some level of transportation fixed in this state because gas tax is not going to happen, property tax is not going to happen, and the only way to get it is through sales tax. I understand that there are some that says we need more roadways. Don't disagree. But you can't have one mode of transportation being fixed. It has to be multiple. And multimodal, as it's in, in, instituted in 1242 today, is more than just bikes. It's more than just pedestrians. It's more than buses. For our people on the western slope and in the southern part of the state, it includes new shoulders, new striping, new capacity. It's the only way that we have come close in the last five years of getting a transportation bill to the voters that has any chance of all of passing. This is a piece of looking ahead of it, but when we get to 1242, I'm sure we'll have another discussion. This body recommends and has recommended moving forward with trying to find new transit dollars. And if you don't include all aspects of it, it's not going to pass. And we've proven that through Impact 64 for the last three years. It won't poll. It won't pass. This is it, folks. It's 1242 this year or nothing. And if we don't get transportation this year with the governor's election coming up next year, you're not going to get anything. Director Holland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think it, I happen to agree with both sides of this, that there is a, a need that we, we have to expand and and provide and and provide adequate funding. And are, are you up for election this year? No. <laughs> I already won by sixty six point eight percent. So I just I, I want to struggle for those extra two percent next next cycle. But um, as a member of the board of the E four E four seventy board, um, we've seen a tremendous increase in the traffic there. People are willing to pay. For speed and, and, and accessibility, George, and I agree with that. There's a problem. But I have seen in the last five years, 
in my commute to, to uh, Littleton an unbelievable change in the speed, time, and, and congestion on that road. Uh, and we've, we've uh, worked very hard. On E-470, we've seen increases as well. And we're, we're actually putting, we have the capability because the way this, uh, organ this uh, road is structured to be able to expand. We're expanding our roadways on E-470 to, to four and, 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 five, five and five and a half lanes in certain areas to meet the, the, the existing demand. But that money is coming out of, of fees and toll, toll fees. Um, the issue of funding is one of absolute uh, crisis. Um, I serve on the transport as a, as a, uh, a, 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 on the uh, NACO transportation committee nationally as a as a vice chair, um, and and I we find that the frustration there in terms of just determining how to move uh, commerce. Uh, commerce is going to be one of the, the one of the biggest issues that we're going to face in the next 25 years, and that is how do we get products from ports uh, to market? And um, um, we're, we're right now in terms of rail and freight capacity. We have uh, in in our rail movement capacity, we are 40 percent. We have 40 percent unused capacity just on rail now. A solution, multimodal. So uh, I, I have to have to really say that that uh, and support what what Herb is saying with the uh, uh, with the twelve twelve forty two that this is our last chance to provide funding. Um, the the clear issue is that uh, I think the evidence by E four seventy and the, and the growth there in terms of people willing to pay extra that uh, we really have a shot this time in a bipartisan effort to get at least our minimal uh, three point, I think $3.5 billion in funding. The, the, the pragmatic truth is just to bring our state roads up to, up to a C minus level uh, would require not $3.5 billion, but $9 billion. So um, we, we have to find ways of, of of alternative uh, transportation for our citizens and also take care of those roads that, that are in existence uh, before they collapse underneath us. And um, um, uh, so I'm, I'm supporting uh, the, uh, the position taken by, or the recommendations taken by this, uh, uh, by this organization. Director Fanganello. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's important to to weigh in on this conversation um, because there there are no silver bullets. There is no one solution that's going to get us out of this mess. It is going to be a complicated, complex, layered approach that we as leaders in this community are going to have to commit to. And and if we are not able or willing to do that, I think we really need to have a a, a good look at ourselves and what we want our community to what it is today and what we want it to look like in the future. Um, if we think we can have simplistic conversations about one thing being the fix-all, I, I think we have a very difficult time coming in front of us as this region continues to grow and grow. And, and whether you're Denver or Castle Rock or, or Thornton, we, we will all succeed or fail together. And so I think we really do need to support a multimodal approach uh, multi sort of capital stack funding approach all of these things are the only way we're going to make any progress um, on moving more and more people and more and more goods that are coming into our now very healthy economy we want to make sure that it stays that way we need to stay ahead of the curve on all of those things so I, I appreciate that it's hard and I appreciate that it we have different thoughts and different needs in our in our various communities but as a whole we all have to kind of get in together and say it's it's a hard, complex conversation, but let's start, you know, building the lasagna layer by layer, so, you know, uh, mode by mode and dollar by dollar. That's the only way we're going to make any progress. Like Director Christman. Okay, I'm going to bring it back to the draft um, 2040 Metro Vision Regional Docu Transportation Plan, which I am. Uh, we'll be voting in favor of and I wanted to say that I think you guys have done a wonderful job and I think it's partially indicated by the fact for those of you who read 
the um, written objections, there were very, very few. I, mean, I was surprised by how few comments we had on this plan, and I think that goes truly to the fact that it is a good plan, and I would recommend that people vote for it. Director Partridge. All right. I just feel I have to come to the rescue of George on this one. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, certainly there's some strong comments. I, I think what was laid out was truly, truly what we see in, the, in our whole area. We have unique individual jurisdictions that not every component fits for everything. I think what George is laying out is truly what is we see not just in Cass Rock but a lot of Douglas County, the way our population is, the way it's laid out. As you know, 80% of our population is on 19% of our land. There's a large amount of open space, space through Cass Rock, through Douglas County. When you look at bike lanes in the whole metro area, I really encourage you to look at that. Douglas County weighs very heavily on this. So it's not that we don't support it. It's just not a function. When we look at it, 2% of our employment is through other, other than vehicle. So I think really what George is laying out is not that he's, I'm not saying he's a Forward against it, but I think the impression is that we ask for support from everybody. I, I support multimodal where it makes sense. For us, we have much more challenges. We just lost our Highlands Ranch, our uh, Colin Ride, and you know that that just doesn't go well. And you think we cannot support it in our, our, a 90,000 or 100,000 unincorporated area? And you think so? Multimodal is a very part, important component. But it's certainly some areas it fits better than others. So not that it isn't supported, but we ask for support for the likeness of all areas, the individual likeness of all areas. Director Peck. Thank you. Um, my question is, if the transportation tax passes, will the timelines on MetroVision transportation move up once we get some money? Because we this vision is out to 2040 with some um, and I'm assuming transit, I'm hoping, transit includes rail. Um, and just speaking of fast tracks, that's out to 2040. But if we get in your multimodal vision more money, will these timelines then move up? So simple answer to that question. If the ballot measure passes and, and um, you know, the projects associated with that ballot measure, we will need to do one or both of either amending this 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, or as we're adopting this, we're starting to work on our 2045 plan, you know, that would also inform probably what goes into the 2045 plan. Just to be clear, the timeline associated with this plan, when I say 2040 at BRTP, that's really a federal requirement that simply says we need to have a long-range transportation plan that's at least 20 years um, in the future. So it's not so much the time frame itself will change. This is the 2040 plan. But if the ballot measure passes or other funding source becomes available, uh, what would change is, you know, either amendments to this plan or as we do our new plan, uh, the financial assumptions in the projects uh, associated with those financial assumptions in the plan. So this is not set in stone? The it is not. Okay, and in great. fact, um, in our long-range transportation plan, we do amend them regularly, you know, either because of things like this or as projects work their way through the NEPA process and through the project development process, and as they change and get more specific over time, we amend the plan to reflect uh, that progression in projects. So, yeah, these are not set in stone. We do a major update every four years, um, but we amend typically at least annually. Okay, thank you. Other discussion? Director Sable. Excuse me. Um, my thoughts are, and my board's thoughts are, you know, every community is different. And certain multimodal things work in certain districts. The, the best way would be is provide the money and let each community decide what works best for them. If bike lanes work best for Boulder to move their commerce, let them get bike lanes. If in Jefferson County we need other, other ways to do it, just like um, Commissioner Holland said, sometimes we need our roads worked on more than we need our bike lanes 
or our rail lines worked on. And the, the, the worst thing about this initiative is it tells each jurisdiction what it has to do instead of each jurisdiction working into what best works for them. And that's the issue I have. I mean, you know what? We need something. And whether it's this or that or whatever, but um, Jefferson County has different needs than where Mr. Castle Rock or Douglas County or Castle Pines or Superior. We have different needs. And I would love to see the pot of money come in and let those local folks together work on what needs to be done. And this bill just doesn't do that. It tells you what needs to be done. And that's my biggest worry. So one of the things that I want to talk, just mention real quick, I usually don't interject very much because I feel like my job is to run the meeting. But I, we're, we're really blurring the line here between this agenda item and, and so I just want to, I, I know, I know. <laughs> And, and, and there's been, well, and, and actually it's good. We're having the robust conversation. That now we can bypass that one later on. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just wanted to point out that we are really, really blurring the lines between what our conversation is. So did you have something bad, Mr. Rick? I did. I, I just wanted to point out, and it's, and it's true, and, and you know, the commissioner was very eloquent in her comments, and I think that is, it is a discussion for 1242, which we will certainly have. Um, but res you know, respectfully, I do disagree with regards to the MetroVision plan itself, the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. It does not identify um, what communities have to do. Um, it, goes, it goes to extreme lengths to make sure we don't do that. So yeah, I, I just want that to be clear. Director You're right, and thank you for that, Director X. It, um, and, and that's my biggest concern about the whole package of all of this is, you know what, each community knows what it works best. And for the state, the feds, whoever, Dr. Cog, to tell us what, what works best for our community, I, that's my biggest issue. If, if I may, real quick, Mr. Chairman, thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, I want to say, I'm supposed to be saying director, director Zabo. <laughs> um, no, you're right. And, and, you know, we will be having a more, more robust discussion about, because the new tip process that we're going to go to speaks exactly to what you're saying, is that, you know, we're going to have two pots, regional and sub-regional pot. In the sub-regional pot, the, um, you know, those sub-regional units will have more control to make recommendations to back to the full board. So I think we're headed in the direction in which you suggest. And um, I'm really look, I'm excited about the process and, and, and opportunities associated with it. So in the queue, I have Director Stolzman and Director Shakti. Did I miss anybody? Director Stolzman. Thank you very much. So just on this particular agenda item and its scope only, and not I, I look forward to the future conversations on the um, tax, on a potential tax and on the TIP discussion as well. But I do think we have an obligation to the federal government to do some of the things that we've laid out here so that we show them that we're using the money that they're passing to Dr. Cog correctly. So we have, we have to show that we meet the um, ozone and PM10 conformity determination. Like we have to go through these things and determine these things. So if there are objections to how it's been done, I, I, I'm open to hearing those, but I feel that the staff has done what we need to do to show that we have a regional transportation plan through 2040 made up of member submitted projects and that it conforms with the various air quality standards that it needs to conform with. So for those reasons, I'm comfortable with the staff recommendation. Director Shakti. Uh, um, that goes to a lot of what I was going to say. And I would just add that um, uh, Ashley said the um, submitted by jurisdictions. So I, I think the plan in front of us doesn't tell the jurisdictions what they have to do, except to the extent that it does list projects, because the federal government requires that we list projects in the financially constrained plan. And the way those projects were selected was it, it's what the jurisdictions said that they would like to be working on. So that's what we have to vote on before us. Director Henry. You know, as much as I love this conversation and as much as it's going, I want to call the question. We have a motion to call the question. 
Motion and a second. All those in favor of calling the question? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Can I have a motion uh, on the, no, I guess I don't need a motion. All those in favor of the staff recommendation, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Agenda item 12 is attachment E, and we are back to Mr. Cottrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this item concerns uh, the 1821 TIP. Uh, so Dr. Cog has developed a new TIP, and it does cover these new four fi uh, federal fiscal years. So this TIP introduces a new timeline to Dr. Cog, um, where now TIPs are going to be developed every two years instead of every four years. And this is to better align with the statewide transportation improvement program, or the STIP, that CDOT produces, which is now being developed annually. So due to the call for projects at, uh, at Dr. Cog that was held just two years ago with the 1621 TIP, uh, projects that were incorporated into the 16 TIP are simply being transferred over to this new uh, action draft of the 18 TIP. So at this time, we are still continuing to plan on uh, a call for projects every four years, even though we are producing a TIP every two years. So you know, I'm hesitant to say that the TIPs that where there is no call for projects, that it's more administrative in action, uh, but that's kind of the way that where there is no call for projects, uh, projects are simply just transferred over. So this action tonight also includes the documents uh, outlining the air quality conformity determination documents for the region. Um, going back to where, what uh, Jacob had said earlier tonight, and just reiterating that all uh, pollution emission tests were passed. Um, it was also mentioned by Jacob that one month ago at your last meeting, there was a public hearing, and the TIP was part of that. So attachment one that you have um, contained in attachment E summarizes those public comments that were received. Um, if you take a look at attachment two, that also highlights the proposed changes between the public hearing, ver public hearing version of the draft TIP, which you saw last month, and the action draft, which is now linked in your attachment E. So in conclusion, I'm happy to answer any questions or comments that you may have. Um, if not, the action before you is to move to adopt the 1821 TIP and the associated air quality conformity documents. Questions of staff? Director Cernanek. Uh, thank you. Um, and my question is, it has to do more with the air quality and assumptions around some of that. Um, do we ever at any point in time assume a reduction in transport in contributing to uh, our um, nonconformance in air quality? Mr. Rex. Oh, wow. Um, I don't know if there's anyone on the rack wants to answer this, but I think the question is, the, the answer is basically no. Um, there are no assumptions with regards to the reduction of transport that go into the actual calculation. To the best of my knowledge, I'm looking at Steve or Jacob or anyone who might serve on the rack might, might know. Yeah, that's correct. So, you know, again, you know, looking at the growth assumptions that I presented, um, you know, there will be a lot more vehicle miles traveled in the region. You know, not necessarily vehicle miles per capita, that's a separate issue, but you know, not a reduction of transport, but there are many uh, sort of factors in there relating to fuel efficiency and technology and those sorts of things that are accounted for uh, in the air quality modeling. Other questions? Director Pfeiffer. If there's no other questions, I'd like to make the motion. Please do. Yeah, I move to adopt a resolution approving the draft 2018 through 21 transportation improvement program and the associated Dr. Cog CONPM 10 conformity determination and the Denver Southern sub area eight hour ozone conformity uh, determination concurrently. Second. Have a motion and a second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, we probably should read the motions. Mr. Chair, we should probably read the motions versus saying so moved all the time. Just probably proper order. Is, is Director Pfeiffer bringing up a point well, of order? <laughs> <laughs> well, just last time we had a lot of debate over no, no motion. And there was no motion on the table, and then we voted on calling the question when there's no motion. Yeah, there was a motion. There was a motion. Who made the motion? Okay. Again, clarity in the motions would be nice. So. Okay. 
Thank Point you, taken. Mr. Chair. Did you have something, Mr. Eager? Okay, okay. all right, thank you. Um, agenda item 13 is attachment F which is for two members and at least four alternates for the RTC. Uh, Mr. Rex. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, you know, each year we do appoint two members to the uh, Regional Transportation Committee, or RTC, and a uh, minimum of four alternates. I'll probably guilt some people into the alternates. I don't know if we have a huge group to choose from from that group. Um, but the current members are uh, Director Rakowski and Director Stolzman. Um, we have there have we have had expressed interest from um, uh, uh, Mayor Rakowski. Director Rakowski would like to continue to serve. Um, Director Williams, Director Teal, and Director I'm going to Odoricio. Odoricio, thank you very much. Um, have expressed interest in serving on on the committee. You know, so it's four to pick two. Um, uh, I, I I would be remiss if I did not say that. Um, that Director Rakowski was unable to be at the meeting today. He had a prior family engagement, but he did provide a letter, which was included in your packet here somewhere, I believe. On the table. Yes. Oh, on, oh, yeah, I, I, on the table in front of you, um, expressing his desire to uh, continue to serve. Um, so, so I'll point out one thing. Um, it's in the packet here, but the board chair and vice chair are automatic designees to RTC. So we actually have four members and four alt at least four alternates. So the um, director Atchison and I are automatic uh, members, and we're appointing the other two, and then looking for at least four alternates, as well as the executive director. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Yeah. So how do we want to do this? Um, I would suggest we do a, a ballot. Oh, we've got it. And Connie has those in front of her, so she'll pass those around. So Again, the, the those that are that have expressed interest are located on the second page of this item. So you're just going to get one of them and put two names on it, please. Are we asking for Chair Roth? Yes. Can I make me over here? Yes. <laughs> is, is it possible for us to speak in favor of, of a member that, you know, Commissioner Odoricio couldn't be here. He's my alternate for Adams County. And he is very passionate about transportation. I know a lot of you haven't had a chance to get to know who he is, but it would be really nice to have a commissioner on there, and it'd be really nice to have someone that's north of I-70 to represent our community. So thank just put in it to make sure you let him know that I did speak for him, if you all see him, okay, favorably, so I get some kudos. And just Director Williams. So, and I'm also up north. And I've served on several transportation committees, including um, I'm the recent past chair of Metro Mayor's Caucus and have quite a bit of experience, so I would like to be considered as well. But I certainly don't want to compete with um, my friend Steve. But I also, I also think everybody should vote for Ron to continue. Direct We're voting for two members, yes. Director Teal. Well, since we're giving speeches. Your last one caused a lot of problems. No, I'm teasing. Just teasing. My speeches are really good at that, actually. <laughs> and that's why you should vote for George Teal in this instance. <laughs> no, hey, guys, you, you, know, you know me. No, I am not north of I-70. I am definitely way south. I'm from the most southern community in the region. Um, obviously, guys, you know um, I'm not the shrinking violet that sits in the side of the room and goes along to get along. Um, I assure you... As, as I keep uh, assuring my fellow town council members in Castle Rock, uh, if you elect me, um, I'll be your representative on the RTC. Um, you know, I, I don't just sit off to the side and let things go by. So I'd very much appreciate your vote. Anybody else that would like to speak in favor? We're not going to take opposition. In favor of one of the candidates. Director Stolzman. Thank you. I just wanted to make a few comments. So I served on the RTC for the past year, and I chose not to put myself back in to give someone else an opportunity to serve. But just some of the things I think you should consider, it, it's really important that people have good attendance to the meeting. It's very hard to get a quorum. Um, so having 100% attendance and being able to go to all the meetings is very important. And it's also very important that we pick someone who can consider um, what the board as a whole would want because the RTC person is sitting as a board of directors member, not as someone representing their jurisdiction. So those are things to keep in mind. 
Um, and then I just, I would like to speak on behalf of um, Mayor Rakowski. He's done an excellent job serving on the board and has um, done everything I think we would want a director to do to represent us. And the rest of the people that sit there um, from RT, RTD, I was going to say RTC, from RTD uh, and from CDOT have a great deal of respect for him. And I think that plays well for us. Thanks. So most of the ballots have been collected, but I was probably negligent in not mentioning. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Director Stolzman, the attendance piece of it. Uh, the meeting is Tuesday morning prior to this meeting, so it was yesterday morning, and we had to delay the meeting 10 minutes because we did not have a quorum. So it, attendance is a huge deal. Um, so although most people have already voted, if you get voted on guilt trip, <laughs> attendance is very important. Director Pfeiffer. Yeah, Mr. Chair, do, is the, if the members that are not selected or the candidates for the membership, do, would they be open to serving as alternates? Absolutely. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, that would be our, our desire if they are. Yeah. Um, having served as an alternate, I believe, two years in a row, um, I would be happy to. Okay. Go ahead. If, if I may, real quick, on, on, the, on the RTC, I... I just to give some perspective on what that committee is, it's very unique to our transportation planning process. Ninety-five or more percent of the MPOs around the country, they do not have a, a you know, an RTC. Um, they typically just have a, a technical committee, which is our TAC, and the board, which serves as the MPO governing body, the policy committee. And quite frankly, I believe this is why our transportation planning process works as well as it does. It's there, it shows that collaboration that we have with our regional partners and the CDOT and RTD, which by, by a, a, a MOU, are, we're joined at the hip in our transportation planning process, and it just seems to work. So all planning-related actions, planning products that we produce, must have an affirmative vote of both the RTC and the board. If we take different positions, then we have to go back through the process again to rectify those problems and uh, come up with, uh, with ultimately a product which, which pleases both, both bodies. Um, that's very unique, and I just thought I would share that in case you didn't know. So Chair's prerogative, I'm going to allow uh, Connie to have a little bit of time to tally this up. So we are going to come back to that item uh, in a few minutes, and I'm going to move on to agenda item 14, attachment G, and ask Ms. Rotano to uh, present for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, members of the board. I'm Dr. Flo Rotano, and I am the Director of Partnership Development and Innovation here at Dr. Cog, which is an interesting title. Um, it's mostly other duties as assigned, and this is one of them. Um, so I'm here tonight to, to uh, ask you to um, authorize Dr. Cog to uh, take over, to provide administrative oversight and uh, services to the Colorado Association of Regional Organizations, known as CARO. Think CML, think CCI, think self-help group for COGS. <laughs> um, the, the, the group typically is the executive director of the other COGS in the state, or sister COGS, and, and uh, the MPOs in the case of North Front Range. And, and uh, we do get together about uh, quarterly and, and discuss issues that are of mutual interest. Um, and it, until recently, PAPACOG, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, has provided the administrative oversight, but they've had significant turnover in staff recently, and the chairmanship of CARO now has moved to Southwest Council of Governments down in Durango, and they don't, la they don't have the um, staff capacity, the horsepower to provide the ad admin oversight. So the proposal is for Dr. Cog to step into that role. Um, CARO is prepared to reimburse us for our staff costs for such administrative oversight. Um, having uh, been familiar with the group now for about the past two and a half, three years, um, Jennifer asked me to step in and take that responsibility. Um, it's not a lot of administrative oversight, so um, should not provide, uh, pr provide much of a burden to staff time. And, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about CARO. Director Teal. 
so Flo, uh, did, did I just understand your comment correctly that this would be your role to provide that administrative oversight? No, I would be a little highly paid to do that. <laughs> Um, it, it will actually be our admin and finance folks who will provide the administrative oversight because a lot of it is budgetary. Okay. Um, and trust me, you don't want me to do the budget. So I, in the queue, I've got Cernanic and Chrisman. Did I miss anybody? Director Cernanic. Yes. Um, dear doctor, what would be the reasons not to approve this? Hmm. Um... Well, we, we don't want any extra income. We don't want a new revenue stream. <laughs> no, the only thing was related to the, I mean, actual staff time, right, was, was, the, was the biggest thing. And we've had discussions with finance and budget, and, or finance and budget, admin and finance division, and uh, they, feel, they feel comfortable with the level of effort it will take. It'll, it's it's going to be, you know, you know, taking over anything always takes a little bit of time on the, on the front end, but once that's done, it should be very smoothly. And our costs will be covered in, in that endeavor, so we feel comfortable. And the part B to that is what is the benefits of us taking on, or Dr. Cog taking on the admin and budget responsibilities? Well, I, um, I, I think that it positions Dr. Cog in a very positive light with our sister organizations across the state and there have been occasions when I hate to tell you this Dr. Cog hasn't been very kindly looked upon by some of the other um, organizations across the state so uh, we get a gold star if we do this I think. <laughs> Dir Director Christmas. Um, I'm sorry I just have a more technical question. Is there a written agreement and, the, and then this renews annually is this the the deal if if uh, if the board approves this we will go ahead and and draw up a contractual arrangement that um, has been the suggestion by both Colorado Association of Regional Organizations and our admin and finance groups so that we clearly understand what our role is but is it an annual that you'll renew or is it a five-year agreement or what 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 are what are we agreeing to I guess is my question yeah, I mean, I, I would suggest that it will be an, an annual thing because dues are paid annually. Um, so we will include and update that, that contract annually. Okay, thank you. Director Jones, did you have your hand up? I was just um, following up on Flo's comment about generating goodwill. It certainly couldn't hurt at the stack table, the statewide transportation advisory committee, for Dr. Cog to generate some goodwill with partners. Occasionally we need them and often uh, statewide Dr. Cog has looked at the big heavy from the metro area. So it's good for us to be helpful to others. Other comments, questions? Director Pfeiffer. I do believe being a good neighbor is a, is a good thing in general. If there's not any other questions, I'd like to make the motion. Please do. Thank you, Chairman. I'm reading it. Because <laughs> I didn't hear Herb's last comments of, because uh, he doesn't use the microphone. Need to. Move to authorize Dr. Cog to provide administrative oversight and services to Colorado Association of Regional Councils, CARO, CARO and accept reimbursement from Carol for Dr. Cog's staff time and expenses related to such administrative support. Second. Have a motion and a second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you very much. And Dr. Rotano is a former elected official. She's a doctor and she occasionally walks on water. <laughs> Only because I know where the rocks are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to uh, agenda item 13, attachment F. The, after a very close vote, the two members who have been voted in are Rakowski and Williams. So now we can talk about the alternates. And um, as has been mentioned, we can have at least four. So I guess I would first ask, um, of course, Steve Odoricio is not here. I, I don't know if you can speak for him. <laughs> to, yeah. I'll, I'll volunteer him. So we have, but, you know. so we have one alternate. 
<laughs> yeah, see, Libby's right there with me. So. We have one alternate, and Director Teal had already expressed that he would be willing to be an alternate again if we could have at least two more. Yeah, I, I would say if you called him, most likely he'd be more than willing to do that. Okay. Director Chrisman has her hand up. Oh, Director Whitlow. Okay. There's four. We get Director Peck, five. Anybody else? Very good. We have our, did you, oh, Director Jones. I was going to volunteer, but I don't think I need to. I'm just here to serve if you're, there weren't enough. If, but there are enough. I'm just noting. <laughs> so. So if we can have a motion to accept those five as the alternates. And, excuse me, and the two members, yes. Add a motion and a second. Well, the, the, the chair and vice chair are automatic. Uh, yeah, so we have, so we have the two, uh, Williams and Rakowski, and then five. Okay. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? All righty. Um, that's all we have to, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> um, so we're on to agenda item 15, and Rich Morrow is traveling and not with us. So we have Ev Ed Bodich and Jen Castle here to talk to us about uh, A, which is bills on which a previous position has been taken, and B, new bills for consideration and action. Good evening. My name is Ed Bowditch, and today we have... I think completed day 99 of the legislature. No, I'm not, not yet. The legislature's still debating oh, tonight. Still some stuff going on. So um, tomorrow will be day 100. Three weeks from tonight, they will work toward till midnight and adjourn. Tomorrow will be free again. <laughs> no comment, but yes. Um, uh, we will go over the uh, large packet, I think, on the bills that we have a previous position. And then second after that, there's a one-pager on new bills that I think Rich gave to all of you. Um, there have been 650 bills introduced so far. Um, there were four more introduced today, including the School Finance Act that everyone was waiting for. The budget bill has passed both houses, but is in somewhat of a limbo now. The conference committee has not been appointed yet. There are a couple of bills that are waiting for the House and the Senate to work out a few major differences of opinion. I expect the dam will break one of these days and everything will start flowing again. There aren't major differences in the budget. It's just an issue of some orbital bills that are out there. Um, an orbital bill is a bill that is a companion bill to the budget, but it changes existing statute. The budget bill can't change existing statute. So you've got the budget bill, then you've got eight or nine orbital bills that um, change the law. And so there's a couple of those that are hung up. So I'm sure this is probably the direction you're going, but I don't think we have to revisit every bill, no. just the ones that there's changes or, thank you. A couple of highlights, we'll start. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start on page two, House Bill 1253. This is protect seniors from financial abuse. This is a bill coming from the Department of Regulatory Agencies. So it's supported by the department and the governor's office. We did testify in support. The, the, the only update that I wanted to mention is that it, um, it came out of the House on a partisan vote. So we were thinking that it was going to be in trouble in the Senate. But there was a deal struck in the Senate to um, remove basically all the liability in the bill. Um, so that, that was able, um, with that amendment, the, the Senate did support it. They passed it out of the Senate. We have recommended to Representative Danielson that she concur with the Senate amendments. Um, we do feel, as do other stakeholders as well, too, that that bill is still in a good place, even with the amendment that was put on in the Senate. So we are recommending that she concur with that. <laughs> Moving on to the next page, House Bill 1264, the local PACE Ombudsman. Um, this is a bill we've been working on for a couple of years now. There was a large stakeholder group last summer that recommended that the group go forward and request for six PACE, local PACE ombudsman positions be funded. This bill is already heavily negotiated. It passed out of its first committee, 11 to 0. Um, we're not going to get six. 
when we ask how many we can get, it's like, well, how much money do you have? Uh, we're hoping to get at least one, maybe two. We tried to get money through the long bill by reserving some funds there. We were unsuccessful on a 32 to 33 defeat. But there's still a lot of time left for trying to get money for this, and we'll continue to work on that. It's still in the House. It's stuck in House appropriations. It'll probably move in about a week or 10 days. Next one on the next page, page four, House Bill 1284. This one has had a lot of action in the last few days. This is providing a... Um, if, on, if, if I can just interject oh, real quick. Sure. I think that your pages are one off of okay. ours because that's right. page five for okay. us. Page Thank five. you. House Bill 1284, the records check for employees serving at-risk adults. Right now, if you are want to do a background check on somebody, as you all know, if somebody has been convicted of something, that pops up in a background check. If somebody has been working and serving um, uh, seniors, at-risk adults, and there hasn't been a conviction, but there has been an assessment of, what is the language? Um, why am I blanking on this? Um, mistreatment, a substantiated allegation of mistreatment. Not a conviction, but a substantiated allegation of mistreatment. The State Department of Human Services has worked with a lot of entities, Dr. Cog, CCI, um, nursing homes, the Colorado Hospital Association, who I believe remain the only entity that are still opposed to the bill, to say we are going to require all these entities that serve at-risk adults to do background checks on their employees. And we will be able to list those, uh, those people who have substantiated allegations of abuse in this background check database. Right now, there is um, a, a big concern that somebody may have a substantiated allegation of abuse, but no charges were filed. They get fired. They go down the street and work for the next agency. There is no way for the second, third, or fourth agency to know that this person, frankly, is a bad actor. This sets up due process rights. It has been heavily negotiated. It has passed its first two committees. It passed House Finance today 12 to 1. We were very pleased with that. There are a lot of issues yet to come with this. The fiscal note still has $330,000. That's a lot of money to try and find in the last uh, three weeks of the legis legislative session, but we are strongly in support of this, and it's moving forward. Uh, excuse me. No. Director Zabel. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Why do the hospitals oppose it, or the hospital association? What What's the reason? Um, my understanding is really for two issues. First of all, it's a mandate, so they, they draw the line on any mandate. Um, secondly, there are other concerns about um, uh, the use of this new database. Um, everyone from a, an area agency on aging to a nursing home or a hospital would have to submit names. Um, and you couldn't, you could offer somebody a job, but it might take up to 10 days to get a response back from this new system. Um, the hospitals and other agencies are concerned that, you know, we'll have a lot of turnover and we want to hire somebody. Um, we, we don't want to be waiting for a response from this database. Um, there are also concerns about people who may have done things in the past but aren't necessarily in the database. There are liability concerns. There's a lot of issues. A lot of the, the specifics will be left up to the State Board of Human Services to implement into rule. So the bill would establish the framework. I would say the hospital association is formally opposed. I think they're talking to legislators but not counting votes to kill it. Okay, moving, moving on, the next page, House Bill 1031. Um, this is the Representative Carver's bill of, to hold public hearings on the Transportation Commission districts in various parts of the state. This is kind of a follow-up bill to what she ran last year, which was to conduct a, for the Legislative Council to conduct a study on the Transportation Districts, um, which came in response to us having a conversation with her saying that, hey, um, you might not want to change the Transportation Districts quite yet that would, would dramatically alter our membership on um, on the Transportation Commission. So she did take our, um, take our suggestion, ran the study, and then so this year she has um, this bill to, to conduct public hearings. It is starting to move. Uh, it was introduced very early in the session, but it is starting to move. It's in House Appropriations Committee. It's got about a $50,000 fiscal note on it, um, and it is bipartisan, and we do expect it to pass. Uh, oh, let's see. Where's that one? Ah, House Bill 1242, the Transportation Bill. Um, I had heard you all had 
a little bit of a robust conversation on this. Um, as, as the bill currently stands, it just passed out of Senate Transportation Committee last week on a, a three to two vote with the chair of the Senate uh, Transportation Committee, Senator Randy Baumgartner, voting support. He voted along with the Democrats on this bill to get it out of committee. It's going to Senate Finance, which then uh, this is where the bill is going to have the toughest time is in the Senate Finance Committee. The, the bill, yes, Senator Tate is going to be the key on that, and we are already in talks with him to set up meetings um, to talk to him about this bill. The bill was significantly amended, again, in the Senate Finance Committee. Those more substantial amendments that were put on, I think about 10 or 12 or so were put on, most of them technical, but the ones that um, did have some substance to it, the dollar amount that goes to CDOT was changed from an amount to a percentage. Um, there is now a $10 million transfer from the state general fund. 100 million. Did I say 10 million? Oh. 100 million. Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> just, just an extra zero. Um, 100 million from the state general fund. And the reason that was put in there um, is because the other substantial amendment that was put in is that it's going to decrease the sales tax from 0.62% to 0.5%. Um, so they're estimating that 100, 100 million dollars. Um, is going to make up the difference there. Um, it also does add local representatives to the Planning Commission, uh, it, it, and it also removes the Multimodal Transit Committee and turns it over to an existing committee within CDOT. So not surprisingly, we're going to hesitate on this one for a few minutes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> two things that you have in front of you, one of them I referenced earlier, and that's the letter uh, from the town of Castle Rock. The other thing that you have is this flow chart um, I'm, I'd like for you to reference the flow chart. Uh, Doug Rex is going to kind of go through this real quick so that, um, so that you can understand what that's about, and then we'll have more conversation. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think Jennifer actually did a very good job summarizing where we are. This is the latest um, at the amendments that were accepted um, last week, I guess, in the Transportation Committee. Um, this is provided to us by CDOT, so thank you very much, Deborah, for that. I mean, it's, it's very helpful, I think, in, in, uh, in getting from point A to point B on this, on this thing. The other a staple to this, this flow chart is um, a list of projects, which is, is from CDOT. And I want to just caveat this, this list uh, a little bit. Um, it's really CDOT's, you know, it's their starting point of the projects that they ultimately will have to have included in the Blue Book. Um, they're continuing to the to uh, to refine this list of projects and their their scopes and the cost and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so um, I know Deborah probably wants to speak a little bit to, to to the list as well, just to make sure you guys understand what it is. But I wanted to get it all in front of you all, so you at least have some concept of the types of projects they're looking at in, within our region. Director Perkins Smith. So um, actually, there are a couple of things on the flow chart too. I'd like to just draw your attention to because it explains why we have to look at some things in terms of the project list. There's a pinkish salmon colored box there. Um, it talks about CDOT existing revenue. Uh, the bill requires 50 million a year from CDOT's existing revenue to be diverted to bond payments. Um, it also suspends most of the faster safety mitigation funds, faster safety asset management funds and the late fee funds that we get from faster safety. And those of you who have been around for a while, you know that you have projects in the STIP, sorry, in the TIP, in the STIP, in the TIP and the STIP, um, that are identified as having faster funds. Those would go away. So um, we'd have to find a way to backfill those um, as a group or whatever, or CDOT. So, so I want you to be aware that that's an effect, as well as the Senate Bill 228 funds Transfers are eliminated, and we were, if you know, may be aware that on I-25 North, we have a TIGER grant, and part of um, that TIGER grant is we are using faster, sorry, Senate Bill 228 funds to match on that, and we need the $79 million to get that match from the feds. So again, we'd have to find other funding to be able to do that. So I just want you to be aware of some of those caveats. So it means things are going to be changing in the STIP and long range plan as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, also, there had been a question earlier about local governments, you know, them being able to spend the money the way they want. Um, 
about 58.8% of what goes to the highway users tax fund. So almost 60% goes to local governments and 40% goes to CDOT. So, so you are not required to come up with a list right now as to what those projects are, but that goes to local governments. So you will be getting some of that funding. So I wanted to correct that statement from, that I heard earlier tonight. Um, and then, if, if I may, just talk a little bit about where we are in terms of a project list. So as part of this bill, CDOT has been given 45 days from when it's approved to come up with a project list for projects that would be bonded. Now the locals do not need to come up with their project list. Um, so this is something we're working on and we have our Transportation Commission workshops today. And um, what, what Dr. Cog has provided you here it says a list of CDOT 10-year development program and these are tier one projects. So let me explain what that is and where it comes from. And this is a starting point for us. Um, we have, just like you have a tip, we have a stip for the state. Um, we do not have a long range plan with projects in it that has to be adopted. What we have is a list of projects that total, as someone said earlier, $9 billion. These are projects that have been identified through doing EISs, NEPA studies, et cetera, that we do not have funding for. Um, there is a, we've tiered those into two groups, a tier one and tier two. Tier one we think would be the next things to come into the STIP is kind of the way to think about it. And um, the problem with that is some of the things that are identified in that tier one list have faster, <laughs> have faster funds in them. They have what we think would be committed by local governments but nothing in writing. And so the dollar amounts you see over on the right it's not really a cost, it's what we identified as a need. So based on CDOT's plan, and this is on the website, it identifies, so for example on, uh, let me just give you an example, let's see. Um, well, Santa Fe to Alameda, Alameda, we are assuming that Denver is going to contribute 27 million. So the project cost is not 3 million, it's 30 million. So I, I want you to be aware that these numbers were for a different purpose and it's not the project cost. If you want the full information, I suggest you go to CDOT's website. And if you just type in development program, it'll come up on there. But these are ones in the development program that are in, that are within the uh, Dr. Cog area. And I believe all of these are in the long range plan. So. So where we are right now is CDOT's doing two things. One, we're identifying what the actual cost is for these projects. We have teams working on cost estimates because some of these are in design, some are ready, shovel ready, some are only in a NEPA or the environmental process so they don't have good um, cost estimates yet. And um, so we will have to look at balancing needs, we, there's not enough money in this bill to fund all of these projects. So we are starting to take first what is the actual cost for these projects and then we'll start looking at those in more detail and what makes sense, balancing needs, what things um, can be done within a near time period. We don't want a project that can't be ready for 15 years, that's not going to work. So um, we will come back to Dr. Cog with this discussion next month. But I just wanted you to be aware of this is kind of where we are, and I'm willing to answer any questions. So I want to put a little bit of structure around the conversation. Um, as far as the conversation about 1242 globally, let's start that in a couple of minutes. And in the queue right now, I have Director Teal and Director Atchison. But what I'd like to do is take any questions on this of uh, Director Perkins Smith first. So if you have any questions or comments specific to this, I'd like to start with that. Bill. Everyone gets it? <laughs> it's very complicated. <laughs> Director Peck. Thank you. So your comments are to the flow chart, right? Not to uh, CDOT. OK. Um, to me, multimodal has become almost a buzzword. <laughs> What do you mean about multimodal uh, transportation options account? What is included in that multimodal? I can, I can take that. 
Okay. Um, I don't Ed probably want to add something as well. Um, basically, it's, it's transit, bicycle, pedestrian, basically anything but roadway capacity and maintenance, I guess. So okay, it's not specific. It's okay. Well, it, it's specific to those, you know, to transit, bicycle, pedestrian, I guess transportation demand management stuff could possibly be in there, you know, non, non roadway construction. Okay, thank you. Director Dyack. Uh, Deborah, um, my question is cities and counties, how do they allocate that, that money? Um, is it per population? Is it just equally? Um, so I, the, the way the bill is written, is that what you're asking? The way the bill is written, it's of the, of the um, 85%, 50% of that goes to cities and 50% goes to counties. Yeah, and um, you know, so, so for me, for example, Parker, I'm trying to understand how, from an allocation standpoint, um, Parker gets its funding from that 50%. Is it based off of a population percentage, or it has has? Oh, I see. Percentage? I see what you're asking. Um, you know, they changed it because at one point it was based on HUTF, and I guess I'd have to check and see if that was still actually the case. It is. Okay. Thanks, Herb. It's the HUTF formula. Because that is not the distribution under HT, HUTF. So I think the 50% would come in, and then maybe it's by HUTF within your 50%, if that, that makes sense. That's correct. Yeah, great. Director Cernanek. Uh, Director Perkins. Um, as we look at the, uh, say, the cities or the counties, uh, can you help us put that in somewhat context? Say for every million dollars that a municipality might get in current HUTF allocation, what does this uh, flow chart represent, that 50% of? You know, let me look at that for next time because your HTF is based on a number of factors in terms of what you get. So if, you're, if, if you have a lot of roadway miles but not much mileage, you know, you get less than someone who, yeah, who does but, have a lot of VMT. But if it's so. based on the H2, HUTF, I'm just saying, if we get a million now, how much more would the fifth, that particular stream represent? So the way to look at it is if, if you look at this flow chart, so half a percent, right, is $576 million. Um, so of that, $490 million goes to the HUTF. Of that, the local governments would get 288 million. Yes, what I'm asking is if at the local government level I get. Well, so you have to look at, I could look up what yours is specifically in terms right. of HUTF I, and let you know. I was just saying as a ratio of that, would be easier to explain to municipalities and counties just to do that. And the second question is uh, in CDOT's looking at the project list, and what would be funded if something is in uh, some level of Pell analysis, does it ever have a chance of making it on the list in this cycle? Yes, it could. We are considering several that were, are within, and Pell stands for um, planning environmental linkages. It's usually pre-NEPA, it's beginning of NEPA. So um, yes, those do. Oftentimes we have projects that aren't even to that point yet, so. Please. To that your mic, your in partial response to that question about how much, um, let's say if right now under this flow chart, 490 million is going to the HUTF, of that 60% of it would go to cities and counties, let's call it 300 million, that's probably a little high, but let's call it that. The question, and I don't have the answer, but I'm sure Dr. Cog could get an answer and communicate it back out, how does that additional 300 million in total compare to what cities and counties are getting now? And that's what I yes. think either CDOT or Dr. Cog could get back to you, but I don't have that right now. Yeah, we, so we, can, we can do that. I was just going to say, Deb, that I know. You, you don't lose your regular HUTF? No. Right. Okay. What's the addition increment? to? Yeah. yeah. And, we, and we can do that. I know there were, some, there were some calculations that were done as part of Impact 64 last year that um, I'm sure we can resurrect and, and, and try to get that for specific cities and counties. Director Jefferson. Um, just a second, uh, what Director Ceranic is asking for, I, I, I would appreciate that uh, from the local municipalities perspective, I think it's easier to sort of figure out. For what it's worth, at, um, the National League of Cities 
conference in D.C., CML suggested that we would see a doubling of our HUTF funds. Um, and so I don't know, with all the changes that have happened in the last month, I've lost my sense of uh, where we're at on that. So I appreciate that. Mr. X. I know that, would, that was about right with the, in, with the original bill. Um, now with the, with, the, with the changes and the like, I don't know what the difference would be. But we will find out that information for you all. Okay. So on to the broader discussion. Uh, Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first and foremost, guys, uh, obviously you have the letter that's part of the packet today. So um, I, I'm going to start off really nice by saying uh, uh, Mayor Jennifer Green of Castle Rock uh, gives her greetings and uh, presents uh, the signed letter to you. And it was a unanimous decision by the town of Castle Rock. Um, a couple of the pieces that we see here that we have uh, issue with is um, uh, number one, this is a transportation bill that actually doesn't fund transportation. It doesn't go far enough. And Herb, uh, you know, I mean, you referred to it a little bit in your prior comments, and I truly respect that. Back in the uh, infantry days with uh, Bill and I, we'd say something along the lines of don't make the good the perfect, the enemy of the perfect. Now, this isn't even good, though, guys. This doesn't go far enough. And, guys, I'd like you to look at the, the graphic that we were just looking at. Please go to CDOT. And that very top line, that top figure of $201.96 million. I mean, it's right there in uh, purple and white. Go to the second page. And, guys, look at the I-25 monument to C-470. Guys, that's 270 million. So the very first item that's on the list of possible projects, tier one potential projects, this does not meet. The numbers don't match. It's not even close to being close. It's not even close to matching. To address uh, the uh, question from Director Ceranic and, uh, and, and Joe, as well. Um, guys, uh, we received a briefing, our Chamber of Commerce received a briefing through the Douglas County Business Association. Mary Marchin, she gave a briefing to them. Guys, I know. I already know. Uh, Castle Rock receives 1%. We're going to be due, according to the lobbyists that are selling this to the local Chamber of Commerce, we're already laid on to get 1,444,763 dollars in the first year from the local government share. Jeff, buddy, it's so good to see you here, by the way. So good to see you here. I'm so sorry to say your uh, Castle Pines North, it's already been determined, will get $243,674,000. Um, but that's okay. It'll be $6.8 million over 20 years. Um, Commissioner uh, Partridge, buddy, we're, we're at $8 million the first year for Douglas County, which would equate out to $129,687,340 for Douglas County over 20 years. Okay, so great, I suppose. Um, my road maintenance program for the town of Castle Rock that we approved three weeks ago uh, that's just maintaining the roads is $7 million. So, I mean, I appreciate the consideration of the local um, entities. Um, I'm not really sure the $1.4 million, it, it will certainly make a dent in my $7 million road maintenance program. But I'm not really sure the juice is going to be worth the squeeze compared to the additional taxes on to the people of Castle Rock. Guys, obviously this tax rate is moving around. I believe you guys represented very succinctly that that's kind of moving around, that's coming down. We're getting in the 100,000, 100 million, excuse me, coming in from the general fund. Let's remember those general funds, the, the general fund figure of 100 million, that's still our tax dollars. So what we're looking at in Castle Rock 
um, when the original when the plan was originally came out of the house and went over to the Senate this sales tax increase would put parts of Castle Rock up over 8.5 percent uh, sales tax bear in mind we we do have a couple commercial districts that have an additional PIF that they're charging on the normal state sales tax our normal town sales tax but and so the the answer is easy right um, we're going to get the additional sales tax from the state level so to take care of our folks in Castle Rock and make sure they don't bump into that 8.5 percent well we have the very simple uh, Sophie's choice then don't we we get to cut the taxes that we currently have or we accept that 8.5 percent understanding of course is adjusted down is probably coming close to being the norm and I would wonder those of you who run these numbers in your own municipalities do you have something similar so the idea of I appreciate okay that's great the share back that's coming in but guys we're not even meeting any of the CDOT numbers that they need already those of you who were here for the last tip you remember um, I'm sorry Doug uh, how much money was taken right off the top for I-70 25 million in this tip and 25 in the next Fifth. so this organization has already put up 50 million dollars to a CDOT project the I'll get there too um, I love sitting by Libby but the bottom line is you know we have already given out of this organization to CDOT to help fund I-70 and I mean guys the numbers are the numbers this bill does not go far enough it's simple Greeley public school math so um, we're in opposition um, and I guess I, I would very much like you to join the town of Castle Rock in switching the um, category on this in our direction to our uh, lobbyists from support to oppose uh, it's it's not making Herb it's not making the perfect the enemy of the good because it's not even good doesn't even come close to going far enough and it kind of robs our it ro it robs our own citizens with additional sales tax with the promise of giving it back well at least a little bit one million four hundred and forty four thousand for Castle Rock seems that money's already been spent so thank you very much mr. chairman appreciate it in the queue I have a uh, director Atchison and then director Jones director Atchison thanks sir. you know and I don't disagree with everything George has said no one wants a tax increase but when you look at the ability for us to try to fund something in transportation sales tax is the only thing that passes muster one of the things we've talked about in in these hearings has been let's increase the gas tax that hasn't happened in 20 years either at the federal level or at the state level some projections on what you would need to increase your gas tax is over two dollars a gallon to start you can't catch up with the economy of vehicles people using hybrids using electric cars and electric cars don't pay any gas tax no matter what you do you can't catch up so what are your alternatives you have two you either do it through a tax increase or you do nothing now if you look at the way this thing is set up from the bill itself under 1242 you've got the MIS multimodal infrastructure services you can take the money that's coming to your city or to your county and you can use that money to parlay the grants out of the MIS fund and that part that you get at your city and county becomes your matching part of that application or the grant that comes out of there one of the things that has been done through the amendments that have already been put on is we got rid of the dual committees and we're down to one assignment of support on that is still being worked through with some of the additional amendments and this thing is not a done deal 1242 has still got a long way to go still has an uphill climb if you look at only our individual cities mine included what does it do to me and what does it do to all of us if we look at a tax increase some of the cities in the north end commerce city is one north glen is the other 
this particular tax at 6.25, where it was originally proposed, will put them over the 10% mark. It also puts a potential damper on my city next year looking at a sales tax increase for infrastructure. But I can bear that if everybody's on the same playing field, that I've everybody in the state's on one level, I can potentially go to the 10% mark. And what's magic about 10%? Psychological. That's purely it. But if you look at the opportunities that we have and what's being proposed here and what we've been trying to get to everybody's understanding is we don't have a lot of options to play with on road funding. Now, in the local piece that comes down to the cities, to Director Peck's question, can I use it for transportation? Can I use it for rail? The flexible spending that's been mandated in this bill is that when it comes to the local county or to the local government, you spend it on whatever you want. It's your decision. You can take and parlay that money also into adding more things by going into the grant part of the MIS fund and build up even more. So if you want to build trains with your money, build trains. If you don't want to build multimodal, don't build it. Build it for whatever you want. The other part of this is you can parlay this into partnerships with any community you want, regardless of where they're at, to help them do projects, including CDOT, including RTD. It's your money to spend the way your community tells you to spend it. But we don't have any fallback. Nothing has been proposed at the state in a bill to, as of this morning that has any better options than 1242 does today. If somebody's got one, you got about 10 days to get the legislature convinced that what you're going to do is better than what we've been trying for the last three years to get through. And I doubt you're going to get any support for it because it's been hard enough to get 1242 to the point where it's at already. And it's not, like I said, again, it's not a done deal. But we have to look at what is in front of us, what are the opportunities we have, and do we look at what's going to be best for the entire state, or do we break it down to what individual communities think is or is not good for them? You have to figure out how you're going to fund it. To Commissioner Holland's point, commerce doesn't move everything by just rail or by pedestrian pass or running tracks, but it does on roadways. And without that, the economy of this state will be impacted if we can't get commerce moving. And this is a piece of it. Now, I talked to our representative from Adams County a few minutes ago to tell her that an amendment is forthcoming. And I've also met with uh, Mayor Hancock and Mayor Williams from Arvada last Friday. An amendment is being proposed to come in to realign I-70 again even though every study and every organization from the federal government and the state has says you can't do that, an amendment is forthcoming to 1242, we believe, next week to realign the traffic from I-70 over to 270. Guys, it won't happen. It just can't handle any capacity. Now, 270 is not in my city. It is in Adams and Denver County. And if you try driving 270 any time of day or night, try moving a lot of traffic through there. Now, try to divert all the I-70 traffic onto 270, and we are at gridlock. We will be taking a position from uh, NATO, which I chair, and the U.S. 36 group, I believe, will also continue to support 1242, that we will oppose that amendment if it's trying to redirect the construction of I-70 over to 270. I don't think Thornton, Commerce City, Denver, or anybody else wants to see that happen. But we will have that amendment likely coming. We just have got to get something in transportation-wise that helps us on a statewide level. So in the queue, I have Jones, Teeter, and Teal. Director Jones. So a couple of things. One is as you, if you're going to go through the exercise of trying to figure out what's in it for your specific community, then I encourage you to um, look at all the different categories of funding. 
look at the multimodal pod as Herb mentioned and the projects that your community as you might recall that was oversubscribed here in our tip projects that you would want in there uh, that you would compete for the HUTF in increase the project list which is a starting point we're not done with those negotiations and then calculate how often your residents in your communities are going to want to travel on I-70 or I-25 or all of the other um, corridors that are going to be improved through this. I think Curb is right. This is the only game in town right now. We, more than anyone else, know that we need more transportation investment. And this is the only conversation that's happening about that right now. So I would also say that we, we voted last month to support this. We deployed Herb to um, advocate, and he has vociferously, on behalf of Dr. Cog at the Capitol, to stop now and reverse our position would be um, taking ourselves away from the table and I think would suffer a huge credibility loss for Dr. Cog to all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute, we didn't mean it and we don't want to play ball on providing more transportation funding in the state. Um, I, I, th I think that would be a serious problem for this organization. So. Um, I urge us not to reverse course. Director Teeter. Thank you, Director. Um, Herb touched on a lot of the things that I was going to bring up, and thank you, Herb. Um, five years ago, we went in front of our people, and we did pass a one-sit transportation tax. So they've already been hit with a one-sit transportation tax already, and here we're going to go back to them and ask them again. Commerce City has probably got the largest industrial area in the region. We have 80 trucking companies alone. Biggest profits going to come out of Commerce City, tax-wise. And but we're still going to get behind this bill. We're supporting this bill. We know region-wise we got to have this money to move forward. The one cent sales tax that we did pass, it is currently funding the widening of Tower Road from 104th to uh, Pena Boulevard and it is also it is currently funding a four-lane highway for Highway 2 from uh, 72nd to I-76. So we've already went to our citizens to get our roads widened because we needed it so bad. Uh, but even though this is going to impact us down there, we're still going to get behind it. So the only other person I had in the queue was Director Teal, but before he goes if anybody that hasn't had an opportunity to speak director henry and, I, and i'll go along um, with director teeter in regards to that every major highway in the state of colorado goes through adams county every major highway and even though we're not again and again all the trucking companies are also in adams Co county along with rail so as even though we're not going to get a very large part we're going to be sharing with everybody else. Adams County will be supporting this tax also. Director Christman. Unlike George, I, I can't quote my infantry days, but I can quote She's Mick been in Jagger. A lot of battles, and you can't always get what you want. So, um, sometimes you find. <laughs> sometimes you find. You get what you need. Yes, and that's what it's good, this bill's going to do. So um, um, I think that we uh, need to think beyond just our communities. This is a statewide issue. It is the only game in town. Our economy as a state is going to be um, adversely impacted if we cannot do some of the work that has to be done, even if it's not all the work. Director Sullivan. Um, I just wanted to share some feedback and, and make a comment too to the project list that uh, you provided. Coming from probably the smallest community here, <laughs> I won't even tell you what our share would be because you would laugh. Um, it wouldn't be enough to really do any sort of project locally in Alliance. But I think uh, our board did have an initial discussion and reaction is fairly mixed. Um, there's a lot of concern about the sales tax. I think we all kind of got to the point where we said, okay, everybody's on the same playing field. So maybe that's really not as big a deal as we think it is. It sounds like a lot when you start talking about that type of an increase. Um, 
but with the project list, if you're going to sell this to really small communities who aren't going to get much money at the end of the day, I mean, we're talking just <laughs> a laughable amount for a small community, but we do get that we get our projects done because of the partnerships with the county and the funds they get and CDOT and the funds they get. When you put a project list together that is selling mostly metro area improvements, they're going to be looking for what is in this for me as a voter. And I think you, you really need to look at the projects and if you can include some projects that connect some of the more rural areas. And can we got to have more examples to be able to have the talking points to sell this to our communities. And I know you'll get to that point at some, you know, down the road. But initially as a board, you know, right now we're still at, at the small town level saying, we're struggling to to explain to our communities when we're talking about this how we're why we're behind it when we don't have any details to articulate what we're going to get out of it. So I would just offer that feedback. We're leaning towards supporting it, but I'll have to abstain because our board hasn't made a decision. Director Shakti. Everyone knows this, but I think it's worth mentioning that we're supporting a bill that gives the people the chance to vote on it. Director Baca. Thank you, Chair. I really appreciate the comments from Director Sullivan from Lyons. Um, <clears throat> we have similar issues in Brighton. We're a small community as well. Um, and this will put us some of portions of our city over the 10% mark for sales tax. I think what's important, and our board is also divided, and I will be abstaining from voting tonight because we have not taken a position, but I think Another jurisdiction at our last meeting uh, said that what's important is for this bill to go forward and for it to get to the taxpayers and let them decide uh, if they want to tax themselves to improve transportation. So it is not an end-all be-all for every community, but I think that um, what this brings that other bills that I've seen in the past that have, have not included is the smaller rural areas. And in order to get transportation passed, you're going to have to look at it's statewide and you're going to have to look at the smaller communities such as Brighton and Lyons um, because Bennett. S Bennett and similar to your community when you start putting together project lists um, our projects don't make the list and we have to end up trying to find or partner uh, with Adams County which has been awful. a great partner Just I awful. know terrible yeah. the peer pressure today <laughs> so thank you chair so in the queue I have a director Jay then director Zabel director Jay can you, can you use your mic, please? Yep. Thank you. A little bit of a difficult decision for me because uh, we did successfully uh, add a sales tax increase last year, and, and but uh, has been pointed out that uh, this is for a vote of the people. They can, they can make their own decision. And for the city of Wheat Ridge, we have a lot of, you know, we're very centrally located, so we have a lot of communities around us, and no matter where the project is, we will benefit from that. So I probably will be supporting this. Director Sable. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, listening to all this and the, the, the small towns and the metroplex areas, when I look at my voters and they vote for a tax increase, they think the road in front of their home is going to get fixed. That's their mentality. They think those roads that they drive on day in and day out within the mile radius are going to get fixed and they're not going to get fixed. It, 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 this is a, um, uh, a larger project and I think we need to make that clear to our taxpayers. They are not going to know that. You know, the average taxpayer doesn't drill down like um, Mr. Teal does and know the exact dollar what's coming to us and what road is coming to us. And I, I, I have a hard time selling them that bill of goods, that what you're thinking is really not going to happen, that this is kind of a metroplex plan. And so many people have said that this is just a small portion. Why, if we're going to tax the whole state of Colorado, aren't we going for, for a fix of the whole state of Colorado? Why are we picking and choosing who gets to get these dollars? 
And when we do that, why aren't we doing that and letting each jurisdiction get the fair amount to spend on whatever they want? You know what? If you want to patch every bike lane you have all through your jurisdiction, go for it. But if you have a lot of potholes in your jurisdiction, or if you have a road that needs to be, ha be paved, you should have that opportunity. And I don't see that this bill does. We um, have discussed this at the board, and we haven't come necessarily to a full consensus, so I'm going to abstain also, because we haven't. But we need to be so transparent with our taxpayers before we ask them to give money to something that they might never see or might never drive on. Director Dick and then Director Fingenolo. Thank you. It's my habit to try not to say anything. Uh, all of the things you're talking about are about your lifetime and your children and younger. And that's fine. That's the way it should be. Thinking ahead for the next till the population doubles, if I'm not wrong, uh, if I'm not right, if you know, I believe that two-thirds of all that growth is going to occur in Adams and Weld County, and I'll throw in Broomfield because they wouldn't be missed. If that's going to happen, and we're going to have that much more traffic and transportation needs, we're way behind the game, I'm not asking, I'm not giving you any answers, I'm just raising a question. We want to be fair to everyone. We want everyone to get all they can. None of us are going to get what we need, and I, I can assure you that Federal Heights will get very little, and thank you very much. Director Fanganello. I just wanted to make a point of clarification. Um, I think last month the board made a recommendation on the bill to support the bill. I think uh, Director Jones mentioned that. So we've got a lot of folks that are saying they're going to abstain or vote for it or vote against it. And as far as I can tell, there's no motion and no action requested. So um, that's part of the reason I have not engaged in the conversation. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Um, the city of Denver is monitoring the bill, and that's where we stand. And that's a very good point of clarification because that is a fact. This board did vote to support this. So unless there's an affirmative motion to do something different, Director Zabel. Have there been changes to the bill? Okay. Then if there's changes, the bill we voted on is obsolete and we need to look at the changes and maybe, I mean, what if the, the change was to throw it all the way out and we voted to support it and now it's gone? I well, mean, we need it would to take an, an affirmative motion to do something different. It would still take an affirmative motion to do something different. Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so I didn't have my mic on, so you don't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need, and we don't get what we need. I mean, it, you know, I was born the year that song was written, so I guess I just had to take it all the way. So the bottom line is we don't get what we need, guys. We don't, you know, and I, I got to tell you something. I appreciate Director Sullivan, uh, Director Baca, uh, Director Zabo uh, expressing the fact that your um, boards have not necessarily come to a consensus and you would abstain. May I please suggest if your jurisdiction does not have a full support to give you a yes vote on this, your vote is to not support it. Because what we're, what we're doing when a motion is made in a moment is telling the lobbyists that we either support this or we do not. I would submit to you, I appreciate your logic by saying that you would, you would like to abstain if you cannot support this, if your jurisdiction cannot support this bill, your vote should be to, to be against it, to not support it. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to change the recommendation, the guidance to our lobbyists from support to oppose. 
There's a motion on the floor. Do I hear a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Discussion? Director Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to say I appreciate the suggestion from Director Teal. Um, but I do, I, I feel like p making the decision to support or uh, to withhold support from this bill right now would just be premature. I, I don't know that our, our, our board has really said they don't want to support it. I think they want to understand it. Um, and so my comments were really more, you know, I, they get this is not a problem Lions can fix, that it's not a problem we can fix unless we get together and work as a state. I think what they just want is more information so that we can talk um, intelligently to our residents about it. So, and it's changing. And I appreciate Director Zabo making that point. And I made that assumption that with the significant changes that have been made that we would have this discussion um, leading toward whether or not we were changing our position. So I apologize if I misspoke. Thank you. I'm sorry, Director Baca. Thank you, Chair. And I really appreciate uh, Director Teal's uh, concern and motion. But I think Director Jones from Boulder County also brought up a good point, and we're looking at the credibility of this board. So while an individual jurisdiction such as Brighton, um, I think it's premature for us to take a position of oppose. I'll take this back to our board Tuesday night when we meet, but my role here is also to support the region. Um, and I think credibility and, and having Dr. Cog at the table is important to this region uh, so we can get this bill moving forward and it can get to our voters and they can make the final determination if they want to uh, self-tax. Director Atchison. I just remind everyone, we're still up for another hearing on the 25th. And from what we understand, even with the amendments that have been put on so far, there are more coming. So no matter what you take a position on tonight, come Wednesday, it's going to change again. But the basics of the bill is what we are still supporting. The amendments are going to move stuff around. Some of the amendments that got put on are going to get taken off. This is a moving target. But again, the base bill that was proposed and that this group supported and that we have been supporting at the state level is still basically the same. Director Shaw. I would just like to say that as the city of Lone Tree, we do feel it's appropriate um, in whatever format this bill is uh, presented to the voters, if it is prevented, presented to the voters, that the voters should have the say. That's our, that's our point of view. Director Cernan. Yes. Um, <clears throat> To some extent, this is going to be a, a, a Colorado bill. Uh, it uh, is, uh, as Director Teal has indicated, not enough to address our overhang. Um, however, some of the question is, is it directionally fine uh, in this? And uh, the analyses that I've seen is the metro region is actually net payers is versus, versus where the project dollars are spent. But that's only a portion of it. That's your CDOT dollars. What I love in this is that a fair pot goes to local jurisdictions relative to current HUTF dollars that they have. It's not quite a match of its sorts, but it's somewhere between a 70 and 80 percent increase. Uh, and uh, that's not enough for us. Uh, we're going to have to figure out some other things as far as our local issues, uh, but it does give us an opportunity to have an additional pool that might be leveraged uh, at our municipal level. And what we're voting on is, as far as this bill, is a referred measure to go out to the citizens in Colorado and have them make the final decision on whether they're going to absorb another tax or not. From my position, there's a problem. Is this the ideal solution? No, but it's something that we can get, possibly. Yes, it's going to change. It's going to have some flux to it. But what it is is it's a referred measure that goes out to the citizens, and I believe they should make the decision, and we should get the decision in front of them. 
So Director Henry has removed her named plate, but she did raise her hand, so. Yes, yes, I removed my name plate. I've picked up all my trash. And as much as I enjoy this conversation, I'm going to call the question. So can I have a, uh, all, all those in favor of calling the question? Aye. Opposed? So the question before the board is whether or not uh, we are going to change our position to a position of opposition and I want to do things a little bit differently I'd like to see the abstentions first please raise your hand so now I'll ask for all of those who support changing our position please say aye Hands, please. I'm sorry. And those opposed. Thank you very much. Please continue. Now to the uh, hard bills. Um. <laughs> Next one up is Senate Bill 40. If we have more hard ones, I'm leaving. <laughs> Maybe one more. Senate, Senate Bill 40, that is the uh, Open Records Act modification. This bill has passed the Senate. It is scheduled in the House Finance Committee um, on Monday. The sponsor, Representative I'm, Pabon. I'm sorry, real quick. It's on page 16, everybody. 16, okay. Um, Director Partridge. I'm sorry you didn't catch me. Are we going on to new bills? No. Uh, no, this is still... This is still on other, is, other bills. Just to monitor, yeah. yes. Yeah. No, is, okay, so it's still in the old bills. Yes. Right, okay. Page, Sorry page 16 that. of the old bills, yes. Thank you. I have a comment on old bill before we go on to the new bills, just okay. so you know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll finish this up. So, so this is the Open Records Act, passed the Senate. It's up in the House. Lots of stakeholder meetings, long stakeholder meetings. Last one was today. The next one's Friday. Again, I think there's some movement. Some of the opposition to this bill seems to be softening just a little bit. The parties are coming together a little bit. Before we move on to the sheet with the new bills. Director Partridge. Regarding House Bill 1031, 171031. Can you tell me the page, please? Page 6. Thank you. We had taken a position to monitor it. We certainly heard from lobbyists that it seems like there's bipartisan support and it looks to be on a direction of passing. I would make the motion we change our position from monitor to support. Have a motion and a second to change our position on uh, HB 17-1031 to support discussion. Director Cernanek. I just want to, uh, I don't know if there's any issues around this. This one does does have a cost to it, so it's not without cost. Could could someone refresh us with, with regard to the fiscal note on this? Uh, the fiscal Please. note is about $54,000. Thank you. Hmm? Other discussion? So on the motion to change our position to support, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay and abstentions. Thank you. On to new bills. Attachment I. Okay. So the first new bill want I, that it, we wanted to talk about is House Bill 1279. This is another construction defect bill. I believe the sixth or seventh one we've seen this session. Um, and this bill, just at the last hour, last night, there was a compromise negotiation on this bill, and actually even up into um, the beginning of committee, folks were still talking about the bill. Um, I'm happy to report the bill did pass out of House State Affairs 8 to 0. It was unanimous. There were some key amendments that were put on the bill um, that got everybody to a neutral or support position. Um, probably first and foremost that most fo folks were concerned about was to shorten the statute of repose from 120 days down to 90 days. Um, it also changed uh, the, um, for when the, excuse me, for when the meeting notice goes out to an HOA board, that has to happen within 10 to 15 days 
So that had been shortened as well, too. Um, there was also some amendments put on to increase transparency in the voting process. And also, um, there was a, the ability for individuals to still be able to file suit if there was a claim of less than $50,000. And just to recap a little bit on this bill as well, too, this is the construction defect bill that provides notice to HOA members and also requires a 50 plus one majority of HOA members to vote um, to enter into a lawsuit. So with that explanation, the lobbyists are asking for board direction. Director Cernanek. Uh, question on, on this, and uh, Jennifer, you may not have the answer to it. Um, the key item in any of these construction litigation reform set is uh, is what is in process going to bring back the large insurers to actually reduce the cost of a contractor building and therefore the cost of housing? I don't have the answer for that. You are correct. Um, I think there is mixed feelings on that, on whether or not that will actually happen or not. If it does, it, it's going to take a few years to see a change, if there is a change. So I will uh, jump in on that just real quick, and I'm not an expert either, but um, <clears throat> I sit on the board of AGC Colorado, Associated General Contractors of Colorado, and they are part of the, uh, the HOA Alliance and, uh, and have been very actively involved in, in this whole conversation. And I would support what Jen just said, that uh, it's going to be cautious optimism because it's not, the, it's, it's not necessarily the builders it's the the insurance companies and the banking in, institutions um, they're the ones that probably have the cold feet the most and builders can't do anything without those two organizations so um, I think that there's a lot of hope this isn't the one that the builders would have chosen necessarily but there's a lot of hope that this will be at least a partial solution and that um, people will start moving forward, but it will take a little bit of time to see any realization of that. Director Atchison. Yeah, kind of in line with what Jen and I talk about, we've, we've been very active with this bill, believe it or not, for the year number three, <laughs> between Metro Mayors, Dr. Cog. Uh, 1279 uh, did get one, two, three, four, five, six amendments added to it uh, as it was going on. Keep in mind that this group took a position on Bill 156, which was the original construction litigation. 1279 is an excerpt out of what was in 156. 156 is still alive for about another 12 hours. Tomorrow, 1256 will be PI'd in favor of this bill moving forward. This is, again, a continuing peace with the legislators of compromise and trying to find something that works. The only thing I have not been able to find out is, uh, as we've been, this has been going on active as we've been sitting here, is what are the details in the amendments that were put on 1279 as of today? Some of this looks like it's not going to be a big deal. Uh, I think the big thing we were trying to make sure is that it still had the 50 plus one requirement, 51%. Some of the things we were concerned about was in the interpretation of some of the early language that was put into 1279. There was a notice that had to go out to the ownership. They were going to hold a meeting, the HOA, but there was not clear interpretation of requirement of the owners to be at or represented at the meeting. That was a big piece. We think that's gotten ironed out, but I can't tell you 100% that that's in that detail. But to have a meeting where you don't require enough people to show up to give you that 50 plus one, and then you could end up essentially, you're still three to five member board making the decision for the entire association. That's what we've been trying to prevent. We want the ownership. The other part of that that was a question which is now looks like it's been resolved is that if you had the developer who still had ownership of a number of the units, if a real estate company had a number, the bank had a number, the original piece was they would not be allowed to vote. We think, based on what I'm guessing in some of the language that I see here in front of me on the amendments, that that has now been resolved. If you own, you get the vote. 
regardless of what your status of is, where you've come from as an owner. That was a major piece that we were trying to get clarified because it could be interpreted either way based on the attorneys that we had looking at the bill. If this continues to go through, I think we'll, we're going to end up with the highest level of potential of construction litigation getting something done at the statewide level that we have not been able to in three years. Mm -hmm. Right now, 19 communities represented by most of this body have taken positions and created their own ordinances. But we have told the legislators in testimony after testimony, this needs to be resolved at a statewide level, not local level. But we have, cannot wait forever for you to do something. I think the question that Phil asked was, have we seen any movement? Yes. We actually have projects in the pipeline in Lakewood, in Arvada, right. in Westminster, for owner-occupied multifamily. They are coming forward. But it's primarily in those communities who have taken a stance through their own ordinance or their plat notes, very much like Parker, that's where the communities are that are seeing movement. We don't, we haven't all passed that. Many of you have been waiting on getting the state to do something. My question is for you, if the state doesn't do anything this year, what are you going to do? 1279 is about the only thing we've got. It's kind of like our transportation. We've got one more shot. And God, I hope we can get something to pass. But we have got to find a statewide problem solving to this, not individual communities. Director Teal. I'm going to agree with Herb on this one. Thank you, George. Anybody else? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a couple of the questions that Herb asked. Actually, we, we have a, um, a project going up right now in development in our downtown that uh, the public finance plan, uh, namely our, our share back of sales tax and property tax, actually we didn't consider it last night because, um, th again, this is a very much a moving target, but based on what was going on with this bill, we're going to have a second plan that actually doesn't require quite as much share back uh, with the taxes. Because, you know, we do have a builder considering a condominium project. Mm -hmm. And it was condos on our plat note to deal with it, but they're willing to expand it. So they're not going to need as much of a subsidy. Um, very much a moving target. As a matter of fact, I actually had to send a text uh, back to, uh, back to the, the homeland of Castle Rock um, to establish, you know, what was our position. So, yeah, uh, Castle Rock would support uh, changing our position to support. Director Partridge. Herb, thanks for all the work you've been doing on this and everyone in the room. And just to make a note, uh, whether we have a motion on the board, I have to abstain. We have not taken a position as a board, but we've been very much out in front of the construction defects. And just so you know, we are actually the only county that has a plat note. And last year we had 48 condominiums built in Douglas County using our plat note. So there are out there, and we just approved a prelim preliminary plan for a paired housing project. And the point with that is with the, you know, 20 some jurisdictions that have taken uh, some action on this, it's really piecemeal. So it creates a very uh, uh, uncomfortable situation for contractors building in different communities, insurance companies in different communities. So even though we have not taken a position, we are very much in support of this being settled, and I think a, a statewide solution is certainly the best way about it. Okay, I do not believe we have a motion yet. Mr. Chairman, if it pleases the board, I'd like to um, uh, suggest that I would like to make a motion that we change our position from monitor to support. So this, this has not been monitored. It's a brand new one, so it's just board direction requested. So, uh, I would alter the motion to say to uh, uh, have the board give direction to support. Second. Have a motion and a second. Discussion? Director Williams. I personally support this, but we just haven't taken a position, so I'll be abstaining. Director Blue. Um, Castle Pines has talked about this issue a bunch. Um, we were disappointed when we saw the 156 was uh, looked like it was going to die. 
um, I would imagine my my um, council would support this but again um, this is not something that we can support at this time but I can tell you that I we have a lot of development going up in Castle Pines I know our builders want to do condos and this is something we need we need to fix it now we need to we need to get this resolved um, too many first time home buyers and downsizers need the ability to buy condos and we need to do something along these lines I wish I could support it tonight um, unfortunately I can't but I I do hope something passes along these lines in the queue I have director Brockett Baca and Holen director Brockett I'll just ditto the last couple of comments I think this is moving in the right direction but without direction from my council I'll have to abstain director Baca I echo the same concerns as the other jurisdictions, so Brighton will also be abstaining. Director Holan. I think this is a crucial step, and I agree with, with Herb. Um, we are causing a, a huge train wreck between uh, higher income properties and affordable housing, and that, that roadblock is the lack of condominiums. Uh, people want to move out of their 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 homes into elderly people and young people uh, coming up uh, purchase this so I uh, our our position in the county is that we've supported um, the, the all bills that have uh, addressed this issue and I think we can support um, this uh, this uh, proposal director Dyack uh, Parker supports this uh, we had a plat note we have an ordinance uh, but we also share Director Cernanek's concern that um, uh, we we hope and pray that uh, the insurers and banking industry uh, will come and help us so we can build this product. So I will weigh in on uh, the city of Aurora. We have the new R line that was open with eight brand new stops, four of which are perfect for transit oriented development uh, that desperately want to have multifamily housing and we don't want that multifamily housing to be uh, hundreds and hundreds of 900 square foot apartments we want to have a diversity of choice for our residents to be able to as director Holland said the the younger people that are first-time buyers and the people that are looking to downsize we have to have that diversity in um, it will be an absolute shame for my jurisdiction if we end up with 2,900 square foot apartments out of this deal. So uh, Aurora is very much in support of this. Other comments? Director Peck. Thank you. Um, I have to abstain because our council has not taken a position, but I do think I know what it would be. Um, and I agree with you, uh, Director Roth. We have the same um, transit oriented development that we would love to be able to have in condominiums and mixed uh, affordability so um, I do have to abstain from it though other discussion see none all those in favor say aye aye opposed nay abstentions Thank you. Senate Bill 245. Passed? Not passed? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. I want to confirm. <laughs> Senate Bill 245, we can be very brief. This bill is very similar to a bill we supported last year. So we took a, we had some of our folks testify on this bill that um, would modify the uh, currently, if you're on a month to month lease, um, a, somebody can give you seven days notice to move out. This would move it back to 21 days. The bill is already on its way to the governor, so at this point we don't need to do anything. <laughs> However, Senate Bill 267 is a much larger issue. We can spend as much or as little time as you want. It has lots of moving parts. It will change a lot as it goes through the process. This is called the Rural Stabilization Act. The first thing is do it does, um, that's the title, S Sustainability in Rural Colorado. The first thing it does is create a hospital uh, provider fee as a Tabor enterprise that's been discussed for a number of years it does that but it does not uh, but it does uh, it readjusts the Tabor base so it does not provide a financial benefit to the state it's a benefit to the hospitals some people say that is being true to Tabor by creating the enterprise but not creating 
um, but, but not creating extra room under the state's taber limit. It authorizes the state to enter into lease purchase agreements on state facilities. The state would sell these facilities, lease them back, generate a one-time pile of cash that is estimated in the range of $1.3 billion. It's very hard to predict how much the state could get in these lease purchase agreements. Um, this money would go to transportation, capital construction, and controlled maintenance. The transportation dollars, 25% of the, of the transportation dollars, would be required to be spent in counties of under 50,000 population. The bill also repeals some other current transfers to transportation and capital construction and instead directs those monies be given to rural schools. The bill requires budget requests to decrease by 2% for next year. And finally, when it was in committee and it passed its first committee, Senate Finance, one member threw in that the bill would allow Medicaid recipients to go out of, client, out of network for their services. You can say that's a bit of an unrelated amendment, but uh, in all my years at, at the Capitol, it seems as though the bill title means a little less each year. Having said that, um, <laughs> the bill is potentially up in committee tomorrow. The sponsor even said he didn't know if it would be heard, but it's potentially up in Senate appropriations tomorrow, after which it would go on to Senate second reading. This bill has so many moving parts, a few others that I didn't even mention, but it could be the vehicle that provides, addition, that provides either a hospital provider fee under Tabor, additional money for transportation, either exclusively for rurals or through a mix. Um, the title, it is the type of bill, and it has bipartisan sponsorship in both, house, both houses. It is the type of bill that could end up being the last day of the session negotiation. No, this is not one of the orbital bills. This is a brand new bill. So is this, um, can you tell me what the fiscal note is on this? The fiscal note um, is a thick fiscal note. I just mentioned the one part of it that would provide for the um, uh, transportation funding the estimated $1.3 billion. But there are so many other moving parts. There's slices that go off to rural schools, slices that go off to state capital construction, state controlled maintenance, and so on. Okay, um, in the queue, hold on, I've got to write this down so I don't forget. In the queue, I have uh, Teal, Atchison, Jones, and uh, Chrisman. Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, move to uh, give direction to oppose Senate Bill 267 to our lobbyists. And if there's a second, I'd like an opportunity to speak uh, in favor of the motion. Just to let you speak for tonight, any more than you have, second. Have a motion and a second. Discussion? Um, actually, I yeah. did request yeah. permission to speak in favor. Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, so, guys, I mean, we've seen this before. We've seen this three years in a row. Uh, once again, an opportunity to try to monkey around with a hospital provider fee, and it it just never goes anywhere. Next, it never gets over the the finish line. Um, again, things that are simple, things that are easy, are commonly either a really easy yes or a really easy no. And that was amazing how you took us all the way through the complexity. Usually means it should probably be a no. Just because to make it all work, again, there's something for everybody, but it doesn't really do what we need it to do. So um, I would, uh, uh, as I made a motion, I would ask that you join me in the vote to oppose. So I'm gonna keep the same uh, cue here and ask for uh, Director Atchison. I don't disagree with what George is saying is we've had this bill before, before. but however, this is a brand new bill that's got a set of wheels on it that's running faster than we can keep up with, as uh, Ed and Jen have talked about. I would like not to waste our political capital having lobbyists spend a lot of time on it because we don't know what this bill is going to look like tomorrow. I would uh, prefer if I, uh, is that we would take and monitor this because we don't know what it is. But to take an opposed position this early 
on something that's moving this much, and even the lobbyists are telling us this thing is crazy right now. Uh, I would not want to waste our capital time of having them spend time saying we oppose it when most of us from our elected bodies haven't even seen it. If the maker of the motion would allow, I would amend to a monitor and not to take a position until we have more information about this if the maker of the original motion is acceptable. I would agree. I agree. Second. Okay. So I'm up next. I agree. Oh. Director Jones. Um, I agree with both gentlemen at the end of the table. I was going to suggest we monitor it as well. Not only is it changing quickly, it's involved in the rest of the debate that will also end the last day of the Capitol. I think our lobbyists should represent us and be a part of those discussions, keep us surprised on, and, and that would be the smartest move. So, so George, I'm supporting you. Direct, Director Chris. I'm going to take a picture. Okay. Thank you, Elise. Uh, based on the change from opposed to monitor, I have no comment. Director Perkins Smith. I just wanted to mention that I also believe it, it, it changes so much. I always have to ask our lobbyists too what's going on. Um, it does uh, take away Senate Bill 228 funding. Is that correct? Yes, yes that is correct. Okay. Um, we are also monitoring because we think it will. CDOT is also monitoring because we think it's going to have another iteration or life or whatever. <laughs> Ed, did you have an additional comment? Thank you. Uh, other discussion? We have a motion and a second to amend. Oh, no, to monitor. Director, Director Holland. So we have a motion and a second uh, to, that changed it to a monitor position. All those in favor of monitor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much. All right, uh, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is that we're way over time. The good news is that agenda items 16 and 17 will be delayed till next meeting. You're welcome. Director Partridge. You guys need more than one mic down there, especially with Cernanic down there. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you can't have, no, you can't no. Have Keep the mic, <laughs> We shouldn't make it easier for him. Do I get bonus point time since I kept the mic away from him? <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, I'm just wondering if there's any will, to, since lobbyists are still here, if there's any will to hear about the uh, Homestead Extension uh, Act, if, the, if there's any update on that. Just wondering, I think it may be of an interest to a lot because of the AAA, no doubt. Are you prepared to talk about that? Thank you. <laughs> they, they drew straws. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, there have been conversations, really, um, the whole session on the senior homestead exemption. And actually, Ed and I received an email yesterday or the day prior um, that two representatives, Representative Kennedy and Representative Weissman, both from urban or from Metro Denver, um, wanted to introduce a bill. And in some form, they were leaning more towards changing it to an income tax credit. Um, but they wanted to have a stakeholder meeting today at noon. We attended that meeting. Um, there was a lot of discussion on different ways that they could amend the senior homestead exemption, um, zero it out, um, do an income tax credit, have a circuit breaker of sorts for the property tax, um, include those individuals who are renters rather than, all the, rather than just individuals who own a home. Um, but at the end of the day, everyone kind of came together and said, this is way too large of an issue for us to for you to consider moving forward on any type of legislation. So the this session, this session excuse me, yes, within the three weeks that we have left of session. Um, so the sponsors did commit to holding stakeholder meetings during the summer, and we will be participating in that. So it doesn't appear there'll be no senior homestead exemption uh, change. There will, as, for this legislative session, we do not expect to. Any change to the senior home site? So it will stay in place. It will stay in place. Okay, thank you. So, uh, agenda item 18, we have committee reports. I'm going to turn the meeting over to Director Atchison. By not being the chair, you get up and go take breaks whenever you need them. Uh, let's move into the 
chair reports for the different committees. Ms. Jones, if you would, on stack. All right. Um, I'll be quick. The, probably the most important thing the stack did was unanimously approve CDOT's proposed projects for the National Highway Freight Program. Um, that include, I think, about $11 million for the Dr. Cog region, including a $2 million project for US 85 that cuts across part of our region. We also had updates on uh, CDOT's bike ped program and scenic byways, uh, safe routes to school program, and um, heard about their rest area work. They're working on rest areas and truck parking. Okay. Director Partridge. County Commissioners. I was unable to attempt to defer to Commissioner Director Jones. She so, oh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, MAC had its meeting in Arapahoe County, and we got to hear from none other than Jalen and Derek Webb, who um, came and talked all about the great work that our AAA does and talked about the Boomer Bond and very well received. So, thanks. Okay. Director Sernanik. Yes, uh, at the <coughs> ACA meeting, we did cover the funding uh, for this next cycle, uh, as was mentioned earlier. And a second uh, that I'll mention of uh, element of, of interest is the uh, looking at the ombudsman report. There are 478 licensed assisted living facilities in the eight counties uh, that we serve, 95 licensed um, nursing homes. Uh, and uh, as the, at the point of our meeting, there were 15 assisted living facilities on the waiting list. Half of the assisted living facilities are in the neighborhood of eight to ten residences. And we cover those. Uh, the uh, AAA covers those as far as ombudsman service. Um, we're doing a much, much better job than the state supervision of those institutions, but we work on complaints. Uh, or the AAA works off of complaints. Um, and one of the, the questions uh, that Director Shakti said, do we have enough? Um, and uh, the answer is no in particular instances. Um, it's sad to say what, what is missing is facilities to handle folks that are essentially uh, require Medicaid and are either in dementia or Alzheimer's positions. And um, so it's folks in great need uh, and having secured facilities to be able to deal with those uh, folks that are, that are really troubled. And that's a sad condition to be in. And um, that's the reality that we have across the region. Thank you. Next is RAC, Director Shakti. I just want to add to the Area Agency on Aging. <laughs> no. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> um, that um, there's, there's a feeling that there's maybe an excess of some kinds of facilities and not enough of other kinds of facilities. So if something's being built in your community, um, just because it's for seniors doesn't mean it's really needed or helpful, but maybe. So you have to look into it more. Um, I didn't attend the RAC meeting, but my understanding is that Excel um, presented um, about their portfolio and programs. Uh, E-470, Mayor Rakowski's, um, Director Partridge. Yes, uh, our Vice Chair is going to defer to me on that, Heidi Williams, uh, Director Williams. Uh, E-470 is going well, construction on the new uh, uh, eight mile extension of uh, six lanes, from four lanes, six lanes on time, actually uh, in a, uh, ahead of schedule going very well. Uh, there was a good discussion on, as you know, E-470 is a toll road, but initially with the original legislation there was a highway expansion fee that goes a mile and a half on, on each direction that in includes all 47 miles. So the board directed the staff to look at this as a fee and it was actually set to increase. The board made a motion to freeze the increase and to direct the staff to look at what would be necessary to eliminate this fee. So you can look at E-470 is actually to looking to eliminate fees. But again, no, no uh, motion to eliminate yet, just the board direction to look at it. Very good. Fast tracks, Bill Van Meter. Please, as the chair, I have nothing to report on fast tracks, but two other quick items of potential interest regarding RTD in a larger sense. Please. Okay. 
Um, one was Mobility Choice Blueprint. Executive Director Rex gave a good update on that and stole my thunder, so I don't have to say anything more than, yes, our board passed that. The other thing of interest is our board last night approved the award of a mobile ticketing contract. So um, we will be moving forward with de developing the capacity to purchase tickets for access onto RTD services using an app on your cell phone. A anticipate, based on that, um, yeah, credit card based, um, anticipate that that capacity will start rolling out in, in terms of a day pass and being able to purchase a day pass for use on our vehicles um, within months, certainly by the end of the year, based on the schedule laid out in the contract. So thought that might be of interest to folks. That's it, sir. Thank you very much. Informational items under uh, 19, attachment L. Uh, item 20, our next meeting is May 17, 2017. Other matters by members? At 9.40, we are adjourned. Uh